Does he go for it on the he inside? Touch. He, he touches it. He and runs him up. The 99 slowed down a lot. There. The old one car came in behind Alex and purposefully hit him. In January at the Rolex 24, it was Groundhog Day. These two top teams went toe to toe again. Now the Rolex sports car series switches to sprint mode. There are new cars, fresh drivers, but the same ultra competitive racing. The 2007 season ended the wrong side up for the Speed Source Mazda team. But a new year, new livery, and a new direction turned this team to victory lane in Daytona. The Rolex Sports Car Series revs up after a two month break. Round two from Homestead Miami Speedway next. Racing Scott Pruitt crosses the line for Ganassi's third straight victory in the Rolex 24 at Daytona, and now they can all exhale. It's hard to believe two months have gone by since that memorable Rolex 24 at Daytona, and that means the teams are well overdue for a race. So let's get to it. This is the Gainesco Grand Prix of Miami, round two of the Rolex Sports Car Series. Hello, Lee Diffie and Dorsey Schrader. Calvin Fish with you here from Miami. And just like all the teams, we're uh, eagerly awaiting the start of this race. Let's get this season going. And Calvin, in political terms, the real buzzword at the moment is change. If we look at the series holistically, there's a lot of it going on. We talk about the drivers. In DP, there's only four combinations that drove together for the entire series last year. And it really has been a season of transition. Well, the playing field is very different this year, Lee. For example, Pirelli tyres are on board. They did a great job at Daytona. Out of the box, very strong. Lap times were reduced. The tyre has a lot of grip. But it's a big adjustment for the race teams. Case in point, the Gainesco Racing Team, the championship winning team. They sat on the front row every single race last year on the way to seven victories and that championship. While they were lost in the offseason, they couldn't get a handle on these tyres. Rebounded nicely at Daytona with a runner-up finish, a bag full of points there. They come here, top five qualifying. That's OK, but that's not what we expect from this this team so their drivers their engineers still scratching their heads a little bit so that's drivers that's tires dorsey how about cars we've got some legendary manufacturers but are new they're fresh to the rolex series talk about that well since daytona two major marks have come on board of course delara they've won in everything they've ever entered into and lola cars which is going to celebrate 50 years as a race car manufacturer what that does to the daytona prototype field is add a lot of depth to it with more on this new season here's brian till well, change is the word in the 2008 Rolex Sports Car Series. And for Michael Valiente, this is a new team for you in 2008, your second race here at Homestead, but a new Delara for you guys this weekend. What has been the most difficult thing for you this year, adjusting to this new team or adjusting to the Delara? Well, I mean, uh, uh, the car has been really great. I mean, it just shows how much work the team's put into it because we're sitting on the front row and it's, it's quite an achievement. But the, the team's been really easy to get along with, and I think it showed with my first race in Daytona because we were so quick and had opportunity to win there. So I think things are looking good so far. And the one thing they don't want to change here at SunTrust Racing is victory. 11 times they've won in the Rolex Sports Car Series. Brian, you talk about all the change this year, but one thing that hasn't changed is the 58. It's the same car as last year, the same bodywork, and it's fast. It's up on that pole. And, Darren, we've got the same driver pairing since 2004. Is that continuity going to be key today? I think it is. I mean, David and I have been together now for over four years, and we're very comfortable with, with what we're doing and how it works and the whole program. So uh, there's really no questions. We, we don't have any worries. We feel pretty comfortable. Well, this driver pairing got, almost got their first win at Sonoma last year. Will it be today? New car, new sponsor, Sylvain Tremblay and Speed Source are determined to win this race. Blow for blow, lap after lap, the GT struggle has been titanic and this mighty little rx8 has done a sterling job so far Sylvan tremblay flashing his headlights as he wins the gt division we were flat out the entire time a dream come true Mazda's is back on so many levels personally and professionally that was such a significant and special win for the speed source team and calvin we constantly refer to them as the little florida team that could but now we can see they really can. 
Well, Lee, I think they're the favourites for this GT Championship, no doubt about it. And it's not just because they have the points lead right now. They have an increase in resources. They have Castrol on board. They won the big one. That's the biggest sports car victory for Mazda since 1991 at the 24 Hours of Le Mans. So they have a lot of momentum right now. They also have political savvy. Last year, they won races but weren't consistent. They kind of showed their hand too early. I don't think they're going to do that again. They have a great team strategist in David Haskell who sits on the pit wall here today. He shared the driving duties at Daytona. I think they have all the cards right now. They're sharp operators, aren't they? Endorse. When we look at Rolex Series GT, it wasn't that long ago that this class just simply meant Porsche. It's not like that anymore. No, the GT class is really experiencing a lot of growth right now. In fact, there's 26 cars entered here today, but what's amazing is how close all those cars are. The top 12 all qualified within one second. The top four within one-tenth. What that means is by the time the prototype guys catch up and try to pass, it's going to be very difficult. Let's talk more GT with Brian. Rafael Metos, Nick Ham, David Haskell, and this man, Sylvain Tremblay, took the victory in the first round of 2008, the Daytona 24-hour. But, Sylvain, a lot of people thought that the dominance of that Mazda would continue here at Homestead. You guys didn't qualify on the pole like you did at Daytona. We're going to have a strong car today, or is this heat going to play be a big factor? I think it's going to be a huge factor. I mean, obviously, you know, we, we know this track. We know what happens with the temperature. Uh, just a wonderful race at Daytona for Castro and for Mazda. Here, we did not, we're not starting up front, but that's fine. We have a game plan. We'll stick to it. Uh, track condition is going to be a big factor. Lots of yellows. So uh, I think the Castro and Mazda is going to be great today. Well, they certainly have the home track advantage. They know the track well, and they won it in 2007. Well, Porsche won the GT Championship last year, and Mazda came out strong at Daytona. Pontiac, a bit of a stumble at Daytona. Kelly, how imperative is it that Pontiac comes back strong today? It's very imperative. We have a lot of customer cars here at the track. we got four cars right now. They want to do well. We're uh, surprisingly as better than we thought we were going to be based on last year's performance here at this track. And for the Banner Racing Pontiac GXPR, we, we're on the front, two Pontiacs on the front, and we're here to win races and sell cars and keep our customers happy. Well, if two guys can do it, Collins and Edwards were in victory lane two years ago. And looking to do it again at a track that never fails to entertain. Homestead is just one of those tracks, and 2007 was no exception. Let's take a look at the track map for Homestead Miami Speedway. There's 2.21 mile track, and today's race, it's 250 miles or two and three quarter hours. Things get really interesting when you come off that banking down into turn one, 186 miles per hour. You break on the flat, car wants to get loose, and you end up with a spin usually here in turn two. If you don't, go through three, four, five twisty bits and down the straightaway to turn six. Another place with a big gravel trap to the outside. Don't go off there. The next key, Dorsey, is turn eight. It's very important to get good traction off this low speed gear corner. Here we're looking at the cars. They're scrambling for grip there as you come back onto the high banks. Now the key is for the engineers. What sort of downforce did you put into the race car? Ideally, you want high downforce for the infield, but low downforce for that high speed banking turns and front straightaway. We have already met our respective pole sitters for DT. And you can now check out the entire starting grid with the Just For Men grid rolling across the top of your screen. But boys, let's get straight to the Pirelli storylines, and it's all about time and yellows. Well, Lee, 30 minutes, and that's the amount of time that each driver has to do in this race to score points. The next timeline is 45 minutes. You have to make a mandatory pit stop before that point in the race doors. And when it goes yellow, even more strategy to call. Right. When a yellow comes out, the pace car goes out and picks up the overall leader, or Daytona prototype car. Now, when that happens, the GT cars will be waved around until they get the leader of GT. On the first time by, the Daytona prototypes can pit if they need to. Just them. On the second time around, the GT cars can pit if they need to. And hopefully on the third time around, we'll be back to green. Did you say fingers crossed? Yeah, but I, I don't, <laughs> I'm, like I'm not betting on it. Though. I'm telling you that now. As well, a race car driver, there's a lot to think of, and that's, that's a little bit hairy there. Even though we were busy uh, a couple of weeks ago at Sebring, but for us as broadcasters, we're really excited to get this season going, and so too are the drivers, the teams, the mechanics, everybody. It has been a long break since the Rolex 24 at Daytona, as we've already detailed, two months in total. There has been testing, but these guys are really ready to race. And no one was more pleased than David Donahue and Darren Law when they grabbed the pole 
yesterday for Brumos Racing. Long time between holes for them, and that gave them a real boost. The tricky thing now will be getting the green here and getting down that flat I talked about, Calvin, into turn one and two without bumping. Rojas looks to the inside, thinks better of it. And there you see the 61 machine making a move around the outside. Nice, tidy start by everyone. Mark Wilkins is trying to wrap up Rojas, and he can't quite do it as we get our GT field away. Split starts, as always, and full field this year. And it's Kelly Collins who will lead them into turn one and two. Wow. Andrew Davis got roughed up there a little bit going down in that turn one, one off. area. That's what I was talking about off the outside there in that dirt. Comes back on. And that looked like the Mazda, the 70 speed source Mazda. Indeed it was. So Nick Ham, with his hands full, was able to get it back on track. No damage, but that is a very common place for the cars to run off track. That's Dominic Farnbach, a second car in line. He made a good move there. And David Eppingham in that Mustang, the 50 coming up out of nowhere. That car wasn't qualified that well, so big moves here. Tim yeah. Lewis Jr. too for the Auto House Pontiac team. Pontiac is the car that we will talk about a lot, I tell you, because there's been a lot of uh, teams purchasing the GXPR in the offseason. They saw what it could do last year. They think it's the car for 2008. Pontiac GXPR has had trouble in the straightaways. Speaking of straightaways, here's our DP guys going down into one. It's a little further back in the field. David Donahue still leads the way over Michael Valiente. John Fogarty has got himself up into third ahead of Rojas and Mark Wilkins. That's the top five. That's not the start that Pruitt was looking for from his teammate, Mamo Rojas. He's dropped a little bit. They were the fastest car in a couple of the practice sessions. Disappointing to qualify in the second row. Now he's lost a lot of ground to the leaders. We talk about changing conditions a little bit too because of the tire situation. It's very warm out here today and uh, they haven't practiced yet today. This is the first time on the track for the cars. Brian, tell us more about the weather. Well, Dorsey was spot on. It's one of the warmest days they've had since they've been here over the last three days. And what happened, as Calvin was alluding to with the 01 yesterday in qualifying, as the temperatures came up, that car really seemed to lose a lot of grip. Right now, it's not a good car for Memo Rojas, the grip going away. And as I said, it's 122 degrees on the track right now. It's one of the warmest days they've had to deal with. At least we're going to get some cloud cover. Hopefully we won't get rain later. Well, one thing that Scott Pruitt likes to run in this car is low downforce, but he said it's very tricky when the tires start to get worn and the grip level goes away. And when you get those hot conditions, Dorsey, as you know, the track gets slick, so that may have backed them up a little bit. Brumos leads the way. The Porsche-powered Riley as we climb aboard the SunTrust Delara. Very exciting time for Wayne Taylor Racing, for Max Angelelli, and for this young Canadian, Michael Valiente. Certainly easy to tell the new Delara. You take a look at the front of it, and it's got that big nose. That's like you, <laughs> You're yeah. fine on the front. <laughs> I had to go there, didn't I? Well, you're more like the Lola. I think I'm more like the Delara. But one thing that Michael Valiente said, he said, this car has unbelievable balance and downforce in the high-speed corner. So this is the tricky infield. Let's see what happens when we get to the high banks and look at the downforce comparison. It didn't look like the most straightforward and conventional start. Brian, do you agree? Well, the guys at Brumo certainly agree. They immediately went to the officials, and uh, obviously Michael Valiente is not going to be intimidated starting outside David Donahue. He went to the officials, and the Brumo team said, hey, the 10 car hit us several times on the straightaway on the way to the green flag, so Valiente letting his intentions be known. He's not going to be pushed around. Sounds like a Robbie Gordon thing, as I recall. Well, it's a big time for him because... Uh you know, he's worked his way up slowly in sports car racing, and this is a big-time ride. He probably just hasn't got used to the length of that nose. <laughs> <laughs> Massive opportunity for Valiente as he continues to apply the pressure. Look pretty even there, going through the banking and down that front straightaway. So you got different downforce configurations between the Riley and the Delara. Look Porsche who's power plant up front right now, <laughs> followed by two. Oh, treble here. That is the 59 other Brumos Porsche that I think had contact back there. J.C. France. And for the first time, he oh, begins... Not a good idea there to go into the gravel trap. A new direction, his teammate Joao Barbosa. It is the first time in almost 40 years that Hurley Haywood 
will not be a part oh, of a sports car race. That's what I talked about on the track map. Getting down into turn one, you're breaking in a diagonal, you're really trying to do downshifts. I think he mismatched his downshift and locked the rear up. up. And as soon as it goes around, it goes around many times. Well, it looked like a downshift there. There's a little bump there as you go through that transition door scene. If you mismatch that downshift or as it goes down to gear at the wrong time, just locks up the rear wheels and caught JC out there. He had trouble there twice yesterday. He ran off the track during qualifying. So it's Donahue, Valiente, Fogarty, Rojas, and Mark Wilkins, the top five. Then Nick Jonsson in the Crone Lola, ahead of Guy Cosmo, Bill Orblin, Brad Yeager, and Shane Lewis rounds out the 10. The speeds are up on all of the cars. They're up at 186 miles per hour this year, Calvin. A lot of that, of course, of the new tire. The tire, of course, uh, we know already is faster than the older tire. And so with that, the speeds of these cars are at 186 miles per hour. is pretty impressive. Things are settling down a little bit for Mamo. He seems to have cleared Mark Wilkins now, getting back into a rhythm. And I think that's the thing with this young man. He had a brilliant victory along with his teammates at the Daytona 24-hour race. But I still don't think he has that ultimate confidence. He's a little bit hot and cold. When he gets in the car and it feels good, he can get the job done. But if it's not quite right, it takes him a few more laps to find that rhythm again, Dorsey. You gotta keep an eye on Michael Valiente there in second place. You know, all of that's a brand new car chassis combination, and they haven't done more than 10 laps straight in a row without coming in and making some changes. And you see things starting to twitch around a little bit. And we saw that in qualifying yesterday. He put together a great qualifying run, but under braking there for turn eight, it definitely looks like that car moves around a little bit under braking. And that's the trouble when you bring a car that has very few miles on it to a racetrack on a race weekend, you do not have enough time to get it dialed in perfectly. They'll try and make do this weekend. They'll certainly make this car a lot stronger, even though it's running second right now. Team manager Simon Hodgson said, said yes, we did go to Kershaw. He said, but basically it was a shakedown he said this is one big experiment this weekend for us getting on the front row was a huge bonus who knows what's going to happen in the race and that's why i say they've only done 10 laps in a row because they keep bringing the car back to make changes to learn the car it's donahue who leads over valiente and fogarty the defending daytona prototype champion is looming we are up and away here at homestead it's great to be racing again in the rolex sports car series here on speed And while we're away, plenty has occurred. Like this, John Pugh for Mike Shank Racing is stuck. And this could very well cause our first full yellow. This is the reason why, Dorsey. Again, going down in turn one, too complex. You see the one car doesn't make it. That's different. He goes around the banking. He'll lose a lap because that there. Well, that's Henry Zogabe. That's Zogabe. We're on a full course yellow because that John Pugh car that we talked about, the six, there it is up ahead gets high centered his chassis on the ground but his tires are not and this is critical we've got 10 laps into this race and the key now will be who will take the opportunity to make this pit stop of course what it will do the mandatory pit stop before 45 minutes i'll take care of that but remember for a driver to score points they have to do 30 minutes which we're not at so talking to the teams they feel if they pit right now they would be able to get the rest of the distance done with just one more stop for fuel but there's some other strategy to call there as well so a lot of question marks here today as teams adapt to this new set of rules. Well, that is not the only thing that happened while we're away in the break. Take a look at this because there is somebody new in third place, and that is Memo Rojas, courtesy of this move. Traffic here is what plays into it. And look at Rojas reading that Porsche quite well, runs up the bottom. Contact right there could have been catastrophic. <laughs> nice move then. Really, really wasn't such a smart move there. Didn't really clear John Fogarty very well before he meant move back up onto the racing line that was could have been a big one John this is so frustrating to be there with a car that's not hurt but it's not on the ground either so he's a fast stopped. race car Dorsey is as well yeah shank boys have been quick here and has already gone down two laps the interesting thing about the Rojas Fogarty move guys was in the driver's briefing today uh, director of competition Mark Raffoff said warn the Daytona prototype drivers hey be a little bit respectful and mindful of the GT competitors when you get by them. Oh, what do we had here? This oh, is the level no. five Ferrari. The new Ferrari 430 built by Crawford. Well, we don't know what happened there. Max Crawford put this tube frame Ferrari bef be together. We heard before the start that they may not make the green with some kind of fuel leak on the pre-grid, but obviously they are out there. Scott Tucker behind the wheel right now. This is a great little team that are coming together. Great to see some different marks in the various categories here. Well, what's going to happen now that I talked about before is that the overall leader is behind the pace car. You should see DP, the Daytona prototypes, should be making it to the pit lane if they want to this lap. The GT cars will stay out for another lap, 
before they come in. The key is going to be, Dorsey, who chooses to take this opportunity to pit again. It matches one rule out there, but not another. You couldn't do a driver change and that driver not get back in because he wouldn't have done the 30 minutes. And there are the GT cars passing the uh, pace car. Pace cars letting these GT cars go by, and he'll continue to do so until he gets the lead car in GT. What that will do is when they go back to green again, the guys that might have had a little bit of problem there, like the Ferrari, for instance, if it gets going, it won't lose a lap. It'll be, be back in the game again. That's a great reel. Everyone up to fourth place there, in fact, had, uh, got, the way, got by in the fifth place on back and now getting that wave by. Just keeps more GT cars in the GT race. There we see a problem. The DP cars are trying to get down to pit lane, down to that apron, and the GT cars are streaming by on the left side. So leaders take the opportunity to pit. Rojas does not. And that's what Timmy Keane said. He said, I know what we're going to do if this opportunity arises. He said, you'll see it. So split strategies here. Brian, we know that you're standing at the Daytona prototype end. Get ready. It's about to be busy. Lee, almost every Daytona prototype team is set up. It'll be interesting to see if the 59 stays out. J.C. France, remember, had that problem, spun on track, came to pit road a few minutes ago, took tires and fuel. So he may be sitting pretty, but right now I see the 58 of David Donahue rolling down pit lane right now and further down the road, both Crone Lola's, the Delara of SunTrust racing right behind Donahue on pit lane. Donahue to his marks, it'll be a quick stop. I don't see any tires set out on the wall. Looks like fuel only crew right now saying pump up the brake pedal, taking fuel right now, and it should be a routine stop. As soon as the probe is out, he's gotten all the fuel he wants. Donahue will be out. Chris. John Fogarty down and away at the games go pit. Now the team wanted to take a good look at that left front corner because Rojas got into that car a bit coming off NASCAR 4 when they were uh, collected up in some GT traffic. There is a crack, but no major damage there, so the team not too concerned. Well, one thing I think that Rojas and the Ganassi boys are playing with, I think they expect a bunch of GT cars to be behind them when we go back to green, and hopefully Rojas can stretch out a nice cushion over the rest of the DP field. That's what strategy they're playing right now. So there is Rojas in behind the new, the all-new Pontiac G8 pace car. What are your thoughts? Is it too early to go all the way on one more? No, I think they're good. I mean, most of the teams are saying they can do around the 50-lap mark. as a 91-lap race, so getting a few laps under your belt already, the team should be good. But you see Patterson there. He stayed out in the 60 machine, the orange machine that's scrubbing his tires right now because he needs to get the 30 minutes in before he jumps out. For some of the other teams, they're okay, like David Donahue. He stayed in the car. So a lot of different strategies depending on your driver lineups. You know, and the tires are going to be a factor for the guys that stayed out. They're going to have a lot of miles on those tires if they try to do this thing with one more stop. This is the Auto House Pontiac with Tim Lewis Jr. and Lawson Aschenbach. One of the nicest looking cars in the field. Will they be a contender later this afternoon? We'll find out. Back just in time at Homestead Miami Speedway for the Gainsco Grand Prix of Miami. We are ready to go green. First four cars in the order have not yet pitted. That is Mamo Rojas, Guy Cosmo, Mark Patterson, and Tracy Crone. JC France, of course, was the odd one out after he ran off track earlier, then came in. As the green flag flies, let's go back to racing, and it is the Telmex Ganassi car up front with Mamo Rojas behind the wheel. Mamo Rojas has been at the top of the speed charts most of this weekend, so although he didn't get the pole, he has been up there and certainly deserving with speed. Look at Guy Cosmo. It looks like his tires may be cleaned off a little bit longer. Remember, when you stay out on the hot tires, it can pick up a little bit of the balls of rubber that lay around the racetrack, and you have to scrub those off to get the grip back. Cosmo on a mission right now. This is the eight-cylinder Porsche, and it's the Coyote chassis sitting in second place. It's an older one at that. It was one of the original Fab Car chassis. Now, of course, undergone some changes. It's now the Coyote and Guy Cosmo relishing this opportunity up front. Look at the scrap further back, though. I'll tell you what they better start not doing is running those tires on the outside, Calvin. This place has got a lot of coral and sand on the outside, and that stuff is abrasive and very, very cutting to these tires. You'll see flat tires if they keep running off that road. Yeah, they have to be careful. They have to be careful under braking, easy to flat spot a tire. And as you mentioned, Dorsey, running off in the gravel trap or even getting close to it can cut down a tire. 
But here we see the meat of the DP pack really going out of hammer and tongs right now. And I think this call by the Ganassi boys may have backfired a little bit. They did not have that many GT cars. Here we see Fogarty making the move down the inside. Gets by the 23 of Bill Orblan, and it was not necessarily a productive stop for the 58 of David Donoghue either. Losing two positions to the 10 of Michael Valiente and the 61 of Mark Wilkins. This is good tight stuff. Well, this is what we kind of figured would happen because not everybody's going to come in on those pit stops right away. That was a, a crazy kind of a call. It was right at that limit, wasn't it, Calvin? It would have been nice if it was another five or ten, ten minutes or so. Yeah, I misspoke. It's 109 laps in this race, not 91, as I mentioned. So getting ten laps on the board and you can do 50, that gets you to the point where you can do it on one more stop. So all of the guys who made the stop topped up with fuel. We saw some very fast pit stops, of course, because they hadn't burned off much fuel in the car to that point of the race. We are coming back from our first full course caution. The reason was John Pugh's number six Ford-powered Mike Shank Racing Riley. What's the story, Brian? We saw the car come to pit road, damage to the left rear. It was a tow link right now, trying to get that tow link repaired and get John Pugh back out on the racetrack. But it's a long stop down in here, and they're going to lose many laps. But they want to get as many miles as they can. Remember, we have these sportsman awards right now, and John Pugh would like nothing than to, better than to win one by the end of the season for the most laps by some of the sportsman drivers. So they'll get this Mike Shake Racing Ford back on track. That tow link that uh, Brian's talking about is controls the toe end are the straightness of that front or that rear tire right there and when it breaks there's no controlling it it just turns the wheel left or right by itself the shank boys really can't catch a break i mean they had the all front row at the daytona 24-hour race had some bell housing issues with this six car but certainly increased their pace this year they just need a little bit of racing luck right now chris neville one of the big rivalries last year was between this car the 07 Banner Racing Pontiac and the 87 Farnbacher Lowell's Porsche. Tell us more. Lee, we had a great stop down here in pit lane. It was just incredible. The Banner boys and the Farnbacher boys going at it. And uh, and it was just a perfect stop down here. The Farnbacher guys got out just a tick early, but Kelly Collins wasn't going to give it up. He immediately darted out to the fast lane in pit lane and chopped that 87 car, not letting it in front of him. And the guys down here, Jan Magnuson, Paul Edwards, big smiles and thumbs up. They loved it. Oh, that was close. That's, sweet. that's the race is on is what that's about. Is that uh, Salt Lake City all over again last yeah, really. year? <laughs> Well, I mean, that's part of it. These cars are so equal, like we said at the beginning of the show, that you can't give up on time in pit lane either. you got to race all day. Well, particularly with Keldog, what he believes driving this Pontiac, that he's got great speed around the infield, but he doesn't have the speed on the high bank, so you want to be out front, Dorsey, and run your pace. They've done a much better job with this car. I didn't get to finish that thought earlier on, but the Pontiac GXPs, when they first brought them out here, the frontal area was so much that they were really starting the straightaway, but not so. Here's some trouble in the DP more drama at, oh, at look turns at all that. one, two, and three. Henry Zogabe and the 77 of Brad Yeager in strife down there. And all of that coming out, Calvin, from underneath the car has got stones as you see them bouncing along that will cut tires. You just oh, have to damage stay on the to race the radiator car. too. There's something wrong with the grill there, and this is a big shame because Ryan Dial, his co-driver, had a tremendous run in the warm-up this morning. Just a tad shy of the fastest time of Scott Pruitt in that session so they certainly feel they have the pace made the switch to the BMW the Dynan power that's made a big change to this group but well, that's something unique to this racetrack or any Florida racetrack is that under the grass is sand not dirt so when you come off the racetrack those little splitters in the front dig in they dig in quite hard you see all of the stuff go up over the top of the car and it damages the under tray as we see here he'll have to come in and get that repaired because they're running 186 you don't want to be messing around with that Henry Zoge behind the wheel right now. Cigarette racing BMW Riley. Now, speaking of oh. Daytona prototypes, trouble earlier. This is Brad Yeager in the 91 of Jim Matthews. Get together in turn three. It's a common hot spot. Helping him along a little bit there. I don't think Jim was real happy about the help. Good catch. Good catch. R rides the ripple strip and gets going again. This is what it looked like from Matthews' perspective. The up ahead, the action is already happening, and this is what we expected. We've seen a lot of this type of action through the course of the test and practice days here, Dorsey, and we expect to see a lot of yellows here today. Very tough once you get stuck in those gravel traps. And it gets increasingly more difficult as these guys keep going off and bringing that stuff back on because the racetrack turns into a skating ring. So it's Rojas who still leads this motor race in the Telmex Chip Ganassi Lexus. The car, the team that won an unprecedented... 
Rolex 24, their third consecutive Rolex 24. What a performance that was back in late January with Juan Pablo Montoya and Dario Franchitti in the car with this young Mexican driver and Scott Pruitt. Scott told me the other day he really believes that that victory combined with a full season of Rolex Series racing has really lifted Rojas's confidence level. And you know what makes it so difficult here, Calvin, is that there's some slow corners, like where these cars are going right now are very slow corners, and the Daytona prototypes lose total downforce. The GT cars don't make downforce, so the GT cars in these sections right here are actually quicker than the prototype is in one corner of, speeds. One of our leading GT cars, the 70, we haven't seen it a lot up the front. Is there a reason why, Brian? You know, Dorsey was talking about losing time on pit road. Well, when the 70 came in, Nick Ham behind the wheel, they lost time on pit road because they opted to take tires. The other GT contenders who came in only took fuel. So right now, that Mazda with better Pirelli tires on it. 58 of David Donahue, another favorite in Daytona. Prototypes lost time on pit road. They did not have a problem filling the car with fuel. That's not what took time. It seems like they have a clutch problem right now only when they come to pit road. So they got to pump that clutch up to get it in gear in order to get out of the pits. And Dorsey, you alluded to it. Anytime you lose on pit road, it's time you lose on the racetrack. And the reason you pump a clutch up is because these cars have hydraulic uh, little slave cylinders up in there. So you, it's actually hydraulics and it's got a leak or it's got air in it. Michael Valiente, Mark Wilkins, David Donahue and John Fogarty are involved in a mighty fight out there at the moment, but it's not yet for the top spot. Pit Road guy Cosmo works. For Pontiac GAGT, the most powerful car under 30 grand. It's the way sports car racing works, isn't it? Sometimes the yellows work in your favor, sometimes they don't. And the top three are coming in. Memo Rojas has brought the Telmex Ganassi Lexus onto pit road. Guy Cosmo, Mark Patterson. And we are over the 30-minute mark. One driver, all he has to do is 30 minutes and will score points. So driver changes can be executed from this point. Will Scott Pruitt get in? Will Oswaldo Negri get in? Will uh, Mark Antoine Cameron get in? We are at the Ganassi pit. Tell us more, Brian. Memoros brings it to his marks. Pruitt on the wall. He will take over. It's going to be all prime time. Pruitt, he'll take it from here to the checkered flag. You said, Lee. Memo Rojas has done his 30 minutes. He scored his point. So it's now Scott Pruitt's turn. Brand new Pirelli's going on. They'll fill it with fuel and they'll get him back out. They perhaps have played the cautions very well. This should work. Maybe only one more stop for these guys before the end of the race. We'll have to see how their strategy works, Chris. Well, the Brad Jager handing over the Kodak car to Memo Gidley. Going to be kind of a fast stop here because they were in on that last caution, just filling the car up. But now getting Gidley behind the wheel, getting those rocks out from under the car where we saw Jager go off the racetrack. Now, Gidley thinks he can win with this car this year. He said he'd be very disappointed if this team did not win. We saw last year at uh, at Salt Lake City, they had made some changes to it. They moved that engine down. They moved it forward. They also went from that pull rod suspension on the Doran to the push rod. And... And Mamo, or, uh, Mamo Gidley just saying that the car handles so much better, it's not so twitchy anymore. Well, I'd say for sure, Dorsey, that these guys can do it on one more stop now. We've talked to a bunch of the teams, different power plants. We're hearing 49 to 51 laps is their window under green flag running. We've got about 87 laps running this if we don't go time certain. So they're certainly well within that to do it in one more stop. And I think it's a great call there to bring those boys in. And it was perfect timing. 33 right. minutes, got your driver log done, away with Pruitt. But he's going to need that extra cooling and that new Riley body work. He's got a lot of work to do on a That's going to be a long day. And Calvin, you know, some of these guys are, the, the nature of this racetrack is a lot of yellows you see a lot of yellows because of those gravel traps so it plays into their hand as well that you know there's some of these some of this time is going to be sit behind the pace car more than likely in this springtime race here at homestead miami speedway in the rolex sports car series there has never been a repeat winner in the daytona prototype or gt class will that trend continue and of course coverage right here on speed april 19 at 4 p.m eastern we welcome you back here now though to Homestead Miami Speedway. We're ready to go racing again. You can see lights off on the G8 pace car. And Michael Valiente has a clear track ahead. What about the young Canadian behind him? Mark Wilkins for AIM Autosport. The now Ford-powered Riley. Set to go, sees the green. Let's go back to racing. Donahue is third at the moment. Fogarty is fourth. Bill Orblin fifth. Nick Johnson for Crone in one of the new Lola chassis uh, bodywork cars. You see Donahue 
ducking and diving, trying to unsettle Wilkins right in front of him in the golden black car. Wilkins went a little defensive there because Donahue went it up that inside pretty bad. Nice and clean and smooth. Working back into a rhythm. Chris, what do you have? Well, it's going to be interesting to see if that 61 car can really make an attack for the lead here because Wilkins was saying over the radio he thinks he did flat spot the tires in between those last cautions, that last green flag run we had. He didn't think he did it too bad, but a lot of these drivers still getting used to these Pirellis. They weigh less than the Hoosier they've been running on for a number of years, so the driver's having a tendency still locking them up, getting a little bit of flat spot, but the team said, hey, if it's not too bad, let's stay out and see what we can do with it. Well, the old Hoosier tires were still steel belted, so they're a lot more robust. This is more of a racing tire that they're running on now. When you get that flat spot, Dorsey, that's a call you need to make. I mean, the driver is really the one who can only feel it. The guys can look at the telemetry, the tire pressure sensors in pit road if there is a definite leak. But if you've got a flat spot, that may not be showing up in terms of loss of pressure right now. And, of course, that steel belt in the tire adds the weight to the tire versus, let's say, Kevlar. We don't know that Kevlar is what's being used here, but it's a much lighter tire. The rolling mass is much less, and this is your lead going in to turn one for GT. Yes, Dominic Farnbach. Oh, there's, a seven. there's a contact there between David Embringham and Kelly Collins. Wow, what a great save by Kelly there. Very good save by Kelly because he took it right on the quarter panel where you're most vulnerable. Yeah. Now Embringham having a hard time trying to find a way around the beach. This is a dark horse in this GT championship but showed potential last year but when you got a stud like David Embringham behind the wheel, he can get victories. He tried really hard to get down the inside when he realized he didn't. We'll look at it again here. He's trying not to make contact with Kelly. You see right here, he's got a position on him, but then he pinches the corner not to hit Kelly and spins himself. Kelly with a great save. He was committed there, then tried to get out of the situation and uh, came out worse for wear there. The boys at Black Forest Motorsports who work on that 50 Mustang must be scratching their heads because it was off track in the same corner again earlier today, involved in a skirmish with a Porsche. They got it fixed. There wasn't too much damage. David, of course, is a Rolex 24-hour class winner. He won the inaugural Daytona prototype class at the Rolex 24 back in 2003 with Scott Maxwell and David Brabham. But back at it, it's Porsche versus Pontiac, and Dominic Farnbacher has the upper hand. He is driving with the defending GT Rolex champion, Dirk Werner, who will take over from him talk to those guys and their concern as usual with a Porsche was not to run too fast too early run off the tires and come you know backward in the field and I spoke to Doug Werner about which end is giving up he said it really just depends on the balance I can't just say the rear tires go away on here we see another incident this, this is, is what we expected today that's Ted Ballou in the 66 for TRG same place outside turn one it's so difficult coming from that high speed and oh! right in front of the Mazda he pulls and gets rear-ended that was pretty ugly. Right in front of the race's edge Mazda. That was not a good move. Get back on the racetrack. We've got to leave the racing line available to the guys who are on the racetrack. So Ted Ballou, after a great qualifying run, qualifying six. Bit of a faux pas there. That Punched in the nose there on the old 86. That was Robert Thorne in this car here, the race's edge Mazda RX-8. He has only just got in the car as well. well let's take a look at what transpired and look how much damage is on that rx8 yeah, that's bad damage blue in the 66 just gets in way too hard you know gets down in the corner doesn't get it slowed down it's on that when it comes off the banking it loses grip so now he's done his spin harmlessly so far but he's going to get a penalty for this re-entry because uh it's deemed to, be, deemed to be unsafe re-entry he needs to stay tight to the right and he just goes right to the middle of the racetrack and there you see the damage. Unfortunately, worse is to the Mazda. We get another full course yellow again, which is something that's typical here. Take a look at this. So here's the, he's out of control. Here's his spin. Doesn't hit anything, but this re-entry was just not too good. Was right behind the 57 Stevenson Pontiac of Andrew Davis. May have got balked just a little, and that's what sent him off. And this is Thorne making his way back as we see our third full course caution fly. There is part of the race's edge Mazda on the side seems weird not to see andy lally in the 66 oh, doesn't it unbelievable it's something like the first time in six years that lally will be absent from a rolex series race now because we're under full course caution ted blue has been forced to just drive through because he can't serve his penalty under caution chris well lots of damage to the 30 mazda here guys yeah uh, robert thorne brought it to pit lane 
the team pretty much waved them off and said, hey, it's done. We're not going to be able to fix this. They uh, put the car down, and they're just going to have to drive it back to the truck. Wow. John Meraki will be desperately disappointed with that. Two new drivers, some new sponsors, a new campaign, and a new car. And it has not started the right way in 2008. Time for a quick break. We'll make the most of this yellow and come back. Go green. We are still under caution. It's our third full course yellow of the day. And we are not far away from going racing again. I want to tell you about something we told you back at the Rolex 24. It was Pontiac's Power of the Eight contest. And on Thursday, Pontiac flew the first winner, Robert Manor, down from Illinois to present him with his brand new Pontiac G8 along with a hot lap with, of course, factory driver Kelly Collins. Now, we're told Kelly got up to about 120, completely ran the tyres off the car. <laughs> Just joking, of course. Now he took him for a nice hot lap, and uh, Robert was very pleased. And of course, the G8, the most powerful car you can find under thirty thousand dollars. Has more grey hair now though than he did before. He'll be actually buy one for under twenty grand after Kelly. <laughs> <laughs> this is our race leader, Michael Valiente, and it is a new car for Wayne Taylor Racing. Remember, they campaigned the Riley chassis for many, many races. Very successful. Now they've switched to the Delara. Still with Pontiac Power. And boy, has it gone well. First race for the car. Put it on the front row. And they are now leading this motor race. A lot of unknowns, however, still to see what goes on with that car. Let's go again. Third caution over. We go back to racing. And the field is chasing Valiente. Two great restarts for Michael Valiente. Spread the field nicely. Now we're looking at Pruitt trying to get back in a groove here. Make some ground. He's lost track position. Remember his pits on there. He tucks it to the inside in the grass. Very aggressive move by Scott Pruitt. Just tags Brian Tuttle. Unsettled him a little bit. No harm, no foul. They keep racing. But you saw that right there, Scott had to lock up his brakes to try to keep from hitting Tuttle. And these tires, when they're first out there like that, they're easy to flat spot. We'll have to see. There he's got him now easily. And up's a big one though, Dorsey. I think he may have got away with it. You see Tuttle getting roughed up there. Oh, Bodywork flies. Oh. And it just keeps getting hit. That might bring out a caution too. They're very cognizant of not leaving carbon fiber out on the racetrack for these guys. There's no clearance underneath these cars for a bit like that to get go to. Matt Plum is behind the wheel of the cigarette racing Samax BMW now. We saw what he could do at the Rolex 24 and he wants to show it again. Now our fourth yellow of the day. And I really don't see that they have any choice here because of that debris. We saw how big it was. What would happen if you hit it with a prototype is it would shovel it up and right up to the windshield it would go. And also cut down tires, Dorsey. They need to get that debris off the racetrack. That's Ryan Dial who's taken over the number two machine from Henry Zogabe. And as I said a little bit earlier, he was the one of the fastest guys in the morning warm-up. So expect him to make a charge. But... Quite a ways down the order right now. Did I just put a different driver in a different car? <laughs> I, just, I just did a chess game. That's right. <laughs> My apologies for that. This is Valiente. And I think these guys just want to build some laps. We haven't gone any more than 10 laps yet without a yellow. Let's see if we can do it when we come back on the other side of this. And we will see green this time by end of our fourth yellow period. And it is still Michael Valiente in the SunTrust Pontiac Delara who leads the way. Of course, a massive weekend for the car in second at the moment. John Fogarty Gainsco being the principal sponsor of not only this race, but the entire weekend, including for the IndyCar series later on today. They have over 600 guests here. It is a big, big day for Bob Stallings, John Fogarty, and also Alex Gurney and huge news this weekend that former champ car champion Cristiano De Matta will team with Jimmy Vassa and they will run at Laguna Seca. We really look forward to that and it's great to have Cristiano back in racing. You see Michael Valiente's car do that wiggle again in the braking. It really loses stability when he gets into the brake hard. Watch Pruitt here in the back. Look at it. Yeah, we saw that earlier on. Pruitt is lurking. Fresh tires. 
he's going to start putting the pressure on Nick Johnson in the green 76 machine. That third place car, Dorse Mark Wilkins, stepped out there as well. They're all hard into turn eight, aren't they? And the fresh tires should give them a 10 to 15 lap really advantage on speed. We'll see. Let's look at the downforce. We're talking about this Lola having a bit too much downforce. They trimmed it all out for qualifying. They said suddenly we had great top speed but didn't really have a good handling car. They've gone somewhere in the middle and pretty evenly matched there, Dorsey, down that front straightaway. So the Lola showing straightaway speed right now in race trim. Ooh, he's got a little notion there. Not up close enough. This is where he made the move on Tuttle before. Can he make it stick here? That is not a good spot, Dors. No, you got to really be in there deep to make that pass. Well, the trouble is, if you go through there side by side, you're on the outside yeah. for the next corner, so. It's not worth doing. But you I think, think big picture, too. I mean, he's the championship leader. Don't want to throw there it away you go. here. This is the right move. Inside move from Pruitt. He's not close enough on Nick Johnson this time. Johnson said one of the aspects he likes about this Lola is the visibility factor, both side and rear and the front. He said it's a lot better than what it was with the Riley, and he said he really uh, appreciates that and enjoys it. In this situation here, it's going to come in handy because all he sees is blue and white. Scott Pruitt. Boy, trying to get a nose inside. I think he's got it this time, Calvin. Up onto the banking. Inside run, side by side, Pruitt and Johnson, the Ganassi man. Does he get it done? He does. Got better traction there off of turn eight. That's the corner we talked about. That's going to be slipping and sliding there as these tires get a little bit more laps on them. John Fogarty trying to make a move too now, trying to get around Michael Valiente. Be the first time the Gainesco car has been up front in this configuration. Oh, look at here. Two former Atlantic racers. Two great young open wheel racers. Now sports cars is where it's at for these guys, and they're turning on a great race. We spoke earlier about the comeback of Cristiano D'Amata. Let's hear more from the man himself. Well, it was great to see Cristiano D'Amata back at racetracks last year, but this year you seem to have a different look on your face, Cristiano, and I think it has a lot to do with just a week or so ago getting back in a race car. Well, getting back in the race car, getting back on trying to find a proper job again, you know, knowing that I'm released to do, get back to work. So it, it makes me much, much happier, you know, just much, much cooler. Talking to Bob Stallings about that test, and we were talking about how quick you were, and it seemed to come back so quickly. But he said after it was all said and done, perhaps the best therapy for you over this last year and a half since your accident in August, maybe the best therapy was two days in the race car. Oh, by far was two days in the race car because even though I was, you know, everything okay, no problems anymore, but I still had the last question mark in my mind, you know, I was still wondering what I'm going to do, if it's going to be okay, even though everyone telling me that, all doctors telling me there was everything fine, no problem, but I still had the question mark, you know, I'm, I know I'm going to be 100% happy if I get in the race car and I know I can do the job, I can do like I used to before, then I'll be happy and it was fine because... It only took me three, four laps and it was right back, you know, well, it was big relief, big relief. And it'll be a big relief to see Cristiano back at Laguna Seca. Great to see him back in a race car. And once again, I asked Kyle Brennan about what the engineering data looked like after the test. He said it was spectacular. He is definitely back. I know what he's talking about with that mental aspect. I mean, he knows what to do behind the wheel of a race car, but you don't know how you're going to come back mentally after a, a, an injury like that, you know, and you wonder. Yeah, what if I get in the car and I'm afraid? Right. You know, he just had that concerned look. Everyone could see that he was healthy, walking around, coming to the racetrack, but he just didn't have that smile and that energy that we expect from Cristiano, and now he's got it back just immediately. We saw some video after the test. We've seen him here this weekend, and just great to see him back on full form. Valiente leads the way from Fogarty. Donahue is third. Wilkins is fourth. Pruitt is now fifth. Orblin got by Nick Johnson as well for sixth. Negri is eighth. Shane Lewis is ninth and Guy Cosmo in 10th. Let's talk GT. Let's talk better racing, Chris. Well, down here with Leighton Reese. Leighton just got out of the 06 on that last uh, caution we had. But Leighton, the top three cars still have their lead drivers in right now. Do you think the cars behind that have done the driver changes are going to have a benefit if we get another caution here or the late going in this race? Well, you know, I mean, we just put Magnuson in place of me and, uh, you know, world-class drivers, uh, Paul Edwards and Kelly. And, it's an honor to drive with them, but you know what we're doing is uh, hedging our bets here. We run in both ends of the strategy, and uh, you know we're going to do whatever Farnbacher does on the lead car there, and, 
And then the other car, we were free to play around a little, you know. But we got Jan in there. He threw down the quickest time this morning. It's just an honor to have these guys driving with me on the uh, Banner uh, Pontiac team, man. Just, just awesome. What's it like having Mags run with you this weekend? God, I'm like, don't make a mistake, man. So uh, uh, it, it's good. I mean, just an honor. You know, I've been a fan of his ever since he was uh, driving F1 for Stewart way back when. And, uh, you know, I went to the Formula Ford Festival 100 years ago, and and he won it, you know, so had my eye on him, never thought I'd drive with him. Just, we got these resources, you know, with the Corvette team and we being a sister team, it's just a lot of fun, it's just an honor, so. Well, he's been smiles all weekend running with Jan, and he's gonna get a run with him three more times. The rest of the year, he'll be paired up with Mark Bunty. And this is at Leighton's car, but it is the sister car, the 07, with Kelly Collins behind the wheel, chasing down Nick Ham. We go aboard the 66. Bryce Miller has now taken over from Ted Ballou as the lead prototypes whip on by. He had a great run at the Daytona 24-hour race. Podium finish there, switching over from TRG to Van Bacalols for the 07's 08 season. And Bryce, a little smarter than some of his teammates. The rest of them went heli-skiing last week. He said, no way, leave me out of that. NASCAR race day roars to Martinsville. Look for side-by-side -side battling. Look for temperature flares. NASCAR race day built by the Home Depot. Live coverage begins Sunday, 11.30 Eastern. As Valiant, good song. Gildurs.com. Limited time offer. Order now. Snapchat. We are back, and former race leader Michael Valiente is on pit road. The reason why we are under yet another full course caution, and Michael was right in the middle of the reason why, and yes, that is not a good sign. On debut for the SunTrust Delara, this car needs major attention. Let's show you the reason why as Valiente parks it. It was quite spectacular, Calvin Dorsey. This was quite incredible. Well, watch back in the back. The 58 car, the third car, starting to spin now on his own. David Donahue then backs hard into Michael Valiente, who had nowhere to go whatsoever, taking him into the gravel. Wow, and here we are on board with Valiente. He goes through turn one there. Just all by his lonesome then. Bingo. What a devastating blow, not only to this race, but potentially the championship. You cannot afford to give up a bunch of points in this championship as tight as it is. Tell us more, Brian, you're there. The car's going up on jack stands. It is back in the garage cleaning. A lot of gravel out of the radiators, as you guys talked about. These cars go off, and that front splitter really gathers it in. But I see a lot of toe in, it looks like, on this left rear. I think that's where the contact happened. So these guys are really going to have to look at it. The left rear wheel bent up and it looks like it's taken a big hit it does not look straight to me as it should so they're gonna have to pull the rear body work off it was a gamble coming here with something that was untried but it was very fast out of the box the problem now is not the mechanics of this car but whether the mechanics can get the car back on track race leader is in john fogarty brings the gains co 99 pontiac riley to the box and alex gurney will be standing by driver change to be executed full service here and is the race coming to the defending champions? Fogarty was out. Boy, does he leap out, leap out of that car quickly. These boys really in turn with one another. And you'd have to say that the Gainesco team does not have the speed and the advantage they had over the rest of the field. But they realize, speaking to Bob Stallings in the coffee shop this morning, that there's many ways of skinning a cat. They just want to get out of this race, not hurt themselves in the points. But what a way to do it if they can get another victory. And two of the fastest cars that they would have to deal with are now not going to be able to win this race. And talking about Brian's comment on running the Delara, there was nothing to do with the Delara chassis, the incident, but what he's talking about is the fact that how quickly can they repair a car that they're unfamiliar with? Well, right now, Calvin, what they're going to have to do is replace that upper A-arm on the left rear. There's a significant bend in the back part of that A-arm, so they're going to have to get work done on that. That suspension work is going to take quite a while, and obviously in these two-hour and 45-minute races, any time spent in pit lane is detrimental. But when you come to the garage, you're really falling behind. Of course, these were the front row qualifiers. This is the pole sitter you're sitting there right now, and then... Of course, the other, I mean, the 58 was the pole sitter. It's in the gravel trap. This was outside pole. So two of the fastest cars that you would have to deal with now are out of the picture. On board with Angelelli there. He, in fact, has a relationship with Delara that dates back to 1989 when he started racing over in Europe in Formula 3. So he'll be devastated that his first racing laps in this car 
We're going to start from the garage area. Still an hour and a half to run in this race. And it's all about points in a 14-round championship. Angelelli knows that all too well. He has won a Rolex sports car championship in the Daytona prototype class. What a shame for the 58. They won the pole. We're in the top three, four, all race long. And we only went, believe it or not, another 11 laps. We cannot build laps here without incidents. It's been a real stop-start affair at Homestead Miami Speedway today. No rhythm to this race, and all of the strategies that you play just take a different twist immediately by another caution period. So pretty much everyone will be on the same page in terms of when they need to stop and how much fuel they're going to need once we shuffle through this caution period, I would believe. Let's talk GT, and the pits are open for these boys. And Dominic Farnbacher has done an outstanding job. Team with the defending GT champion, Dirk Werner, the 70 of Nick Ham is right behind. So expect to see Werner get in. Expect to see Sylvain Tremblay get in and Paul Edwards. Chris? Well, that championship winning car from last year into pit lane. Dominic Farnbacher getting out. You think you think talent runs in the family? His younger brother, Mario, was just asked by Michael Schumacher. That's right, Formula One driver Michael Schumacher to be part of a team of young go-kart drivers that he's going to manage over in Germany. So lots of excitement within this team, not only what's going on this weekend, but also what's going on back in Europe. Europe. Uh, Dominic Farnbacher handing over to the champion from last season, Dirk Werner. Looks like a little bit of problem with the jacks here in this car. They're not keeping the car up in the air. So you can see the uh, crew members at the back trying to lift the car up in the air. It's a long stop down here. The Banner boys just about done. They're putting fuel on in that car, but definitely problems with the eight. Oh, right rear tire is on. That right rear tire is not on. The oh. other lead cars in GT are down and away, so big problems with the 87. That was costly. I saw when he dropped it, it was not on. Chris, I was going to try to say it, but you were in the middle of your set. Yeah, so. uh, that's, that's not one single nut. That's five nuts on that wheel, so none of the nuts got on there. Big mistake by the crew. This is very unlike Farnbacher Lowell's. Very unlike that team. Well, there's Sylvain Tremblay. Well, not Sylvain anymore. Now I would think it is Sylvain, I should say. They are going to get out in front, but that was a long stop for the 72. It was. Well, they have to put a little bit more fuel in this car. With the rotary engine, they, in fact, burn the fuel a little bit more aggressively. So, in fact, they get 24 gallons to put in instead of 22. So it should take a little bit longer to fill, but Farnbacher Lowell's gave that one to them. Let them off the hook. Well, while we regroup and regather, let's find out more from Michael Valiente as to how he felt and how he saw what happened down on track. Well, Lee, it was a great debut for the Delar and Michael great debut for you with this car starting on the front row i know you got a lot to celebrate with the birth of your first child last week tell us what happened out on the track uh what well, hang on guys he's getting called back in they got to go back in wayne taylor and the rest of the team pulling him back into the garage they're going to have a quick talk and uh valiente will get back to us here in just a second well, look there, looking at that replay again dorsey like david donahue just dropped that right rear wheel slightly in the grass enough to lose grip in the rear end of the car and then he was just a passenger and uh Michael Valiente didn't see it. He didn't expect that one coming. Now, you wouldn't be looking in your rearview mirror right then because he'd already got his downshifting done. He was at the apex for that turn two area. So he's ready to release the brake, get on the throttle, and when wham, he gets rear-ended from David. While they continue to clean up the Brumos 58 Porsche, we will go to break, come back, and hopefully see green. We welcome you back to Homestead Miami Speedway. Lee Diffie along with Calvin Fish, Dorsey Schrader, Chris Neville and Brian Till. And speaking of Brian, he did a little investigating as to the changes with the variety of cars in this year's series. 2008 marks the first time since 2004 that the Rolex Sports Car Series officials have allowed constructors in the Daytona prototype class to make significant bodywork changes to their cars. And what that has brought us is a lot of licensing arrangements, things like Doran and Delara getting together, Lola and Multimatic, even the new Coyote and the Fab Car. But the guys at Riley Technologies, they kept it all in house. And why wouldn't they? Because this car, the Riley Mark 11, won 44 out of the 55 races it was entered in. That's 80%. Now, they did want to improve things, so they came up with a Riley Mark 20, and we'll take a look at it here in just a second. There are some differences. Let's take a look at the nose. On the old car, the Mark 11, you'll see that the front splitter is blended in with the nose, which means if you have a splitter problem, you've got to change the whole thing. 
but on the new Mark 20 over here, you'll find that the front splitter is actually a separate piece. If you've got a problem with the nose or the headlight, that's all you need to change. It's a much quicker change. You'll also notice that on the new car, every horizontal surface is about two inches lower than on the other car. That punches a smaller hole in the air, creates less drag, but it does create better downforce. And for the drivers, that lower bodywork allows the air to get into the cockpit much easier, a much cooler cockpit temperature. As you slide on down the side of the cars, you'll see that the Mark 20 is much smoother on the side from the horizontal surfaces to the side of the car than the old car. That allows the air to spill off the side of the bodywork as the car is going through the air. It creates less drag. And on the side, down here at the bottom, a splitter or a little lip that wasn't on the Mark 11. This helps create better downforce and stability, especially in yaw. Move on back to the back of the car once again. Lower bodywork allows the air to travel over it get to the aerodynamic devices on the back end of the car and once again create better downforce. So the new Mark 20 should be slipperier through the air, less drag, better downforce, and that's bad news for the competitors because remember, it already won 80% of the races it was entered in. Good stuff. Good stuff, Brian. And that's just one of the chassis manufacturers. You can imagine how much work has been done. Let's talk GT and let's talk Kelly Collins. Well, Kelly Collins now out of the banner 07 car. Kelly, last year we saw the Pontiac being very strong on long runs. The Porsche having a problem with long runs because of rear tire degradation. However, today we just can't get racing. Are you guys going to have to change your strategy? Well, th from the get-go, the, the Pontiac banner uh, GXP, we're basically going as hard as we can right now. The strategy is to try to win this race. we got stiff competition. Yes, the yellows are hurting us right now. We can't get within our groove and start on our long run. What little advantage we might have might be over a prolonged period of time with tire wear. And right now, they get back by us on the uh, straightaways right here. We're all over them on the infield, but unless they make a mistake, we can't get back by them. Once we can clear it, we can get going. So. Hopefully we can have some green racing right now and Paul can give it everything he's got and come up through the field. Well, they're not going to have to worry about that 87 car because it is quite a ways behind. Lee? Yeah, quite unbelievable, that, isn't it? Very, as we said earlier, very unlike Fan Barker Lowell's. You don't win a championship making errors like that and Greg Lowell's will be very frustrated that that has occurred. But let's focus on the front of this motor race. Very intriguing. We've got the Lexus-powered Riley for Chip Ganassi Racing, the Telmex car. And then we have one of the newer chassis cars, the Lola, with Nick Johnson behind the wheel. The Proto Auto LLC combination, Chrome Racing and Lola. Let's go! Inside Oswaldo Negri, typical Negri aggression. Looks for the inside. Big race here, a lot of family, a lot of friends here in Miami. This is a massive day for Oz as we ride with him. Can he convert for Mike Shank Racing and Ford? They were devastated not to have won at the Rolex 24 at Daytona after locking out the front row with both MSR cars. They are delighted with what Dan Davis and Ford and the engineers have done. And they really want to get on the podium. They want to stand on the top of the podium. I don't think he got his tires cleaned up very well, Oswaldo Negri, because he is very aggressive and he's losing ground to the front two right now, Calvin. That's something we didn't expect to see. Yeah, Nick Johnson there in the second car, the 76 machine. What a great day for that team. Rebounding, preseason testing didn't go well with this Lola, didn't get it finished and completed as early as they'd like. A little bit short on testing time. Ricardo Zonta had a massive crash, destroying one of the cars in preseason testing. They just lost enough time where they went to Daytona with the proven Riley. Scored good points there. Coming here right now, running second. This is a shot in the arm for this team. However, he has 10 laps less fuel on board than the leader and also the guy right behind him. How about the car in fourth? The 09 Spirit of Daytona Porsche for Guy Cosmo. Let's check out GT. There's a good scrap on here. Liddell's in the mix, Magnuson's in the mix, and Lee Keane for the second Van Barker Lowell's car. And they got all those pesky Daytona prototypes around them while they're doing business. Oof, that's a chop. That was tight. The Pontiac GTO, ah, there of Diego Alessi for Matt Connolly Racing. Drifts to the outside, the Chrome Daytona prototype gets through. Was there contact? Oh, there's going to be if there hasn't been. And now the 06 slides his way through there. Great move by Magnuson, taking the point. Can you imagine how excited Mike Johnson and Stevenson Motorsports would be right now? Their new car, their new driver combination in that 57. The red, white, and blue car are in contention in this GT race. Brian, tell us more about the 10. Michael Valiente back from talking to Max Angelelli before he got back on track. Where we were, Michael, was talking about what happened on the racetrack after that great opening drive. Uh, yeah, I mean, the car was great, especially in the first stint there. 
and uh, we were having some brake issues. I was really struggling towards the end of that stint, but uh, out of nowhere, I just got hit from behind, and I guess it was the 58 or the 59 car, and uh, took us both out. When you look at the performance over the car of the car though over that stint, does that make you hopeful and make you want to get back in for the rest of the season? Yeah, yeah, definitely. The uh, the team's done a phenomenal job. The car, you know, has a lot of potential, but there's still some things to sort out that will, you know, make us a definite, consistent front runner. Well, best of luck next time. We'll let him go. He was headed into the trailer. Going to change his clothes and get back out and cheer Max Angelelli on. He may look at the crib cam too, guys. Remember, his wife just had their first son last week, Massimo. They got a little crib cam set up so he can keep an eye on the baby at home. Yeah, we congratulate Michael and his wife, Nicola. Congratulations. The scrap continues out on track, though. Diego Alessi in the 21 is trying to fend off a very determined Lee Keen for Fan Barcalols. This is Angelelli back out on track, getting at it, making up positions, trying to yield some points. Diego has a little problem on the left front there. We'll take a ride with uh, Paul Edwards here. This is a 07 Pontiac. Oh, 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 oh. Oh. I'm coming through. Impressive move there. Down on the inside of Patrick Dempsey in the Hypersport Mazda. And he was thinking Patrick was just going to give him that. Not often you can hit a Hollywood star and get away with it, but you can on the <laughs> racetrack. That's right. No makeup for these race guys. How about the overall top 10? This is what it looks like. Pruitt, Negri, Johnson, Cosmo, Shane Lewis for Southern Motorsports. New bodywork on there, Riley, as well. They'd be inspired to be in fifth. Goosens is sixth. Gidley is seventh. Matt Plum in the Rum Bum Seagull Sport car is eight. Joao Barbosa for Brumos is nine. And Gurney is ten. This is the GT leader, though, Jan Magnussen. You got to be impressed with this Pontiac program because these cars struggled here in the last couple of years with their frontal area. They've done some development on it without question. Very solid run. You heard the excitement in Leighton Reese's voice earlier. We were mentioning also about Crone Racing and the just inspiring performance at the moment in third. Jonsson sitting there. Let's hear from the, uh, the team. Jeff Hazel right now writing some notes down. He's been watching that 76 car move up throughout the race. Jeff, we had a chance to talk at Daytona and earlier this weekend here about the downforce on this car. And you gave me that wry smile and said, wait until later in the year. But the downforce, does it seem to be helping right now, considering the track seems to be really going away from a lot of these other teams? Well, we're not running much downforce here. We haven't got the greatest aero set up for this circuit. So we're having to run with very little downforce. But uh, I think we'll be better balanced on the road tracks later in the year. But at the moment, we're struggling. Are you surprised a bit, though, or is it just pit strategy right now that's moved you guys up into the top three? Well, I think there's been some unfortunate incidents uh, with people at the front trying a little hard. So we just keep our noses clean and collect some points, I hope. That's what they're after, guys. And as Jeff said, keep an eye on them later because they really think this car, on the short courses especially, is going to be spectacular. And remember, it's based upon the Multimatic, and that car has not been developed a lot over the last several years. Jeff talked about the downforce setting. The car in general, Dorsey, has more downforce, but you can alter the downforce setting on the car for the race. Here we see, I think that may be Dempsey there off to the inside. Well, I'm sure 57 that smoking right there. That car is the car we just talked about, Michael Johnson in the Stevenson car. And look at... I can't tell if that's oil smoke. And now that with the Patrick one Mazda. Dempsey. That's Patrick Dempsey who's spun. There was contact possibly with the 57 that has Robin Liddell behind the wheel. And just to get back to that chrome racing issue, you can trim some of the wing out of the car. And they said that gave it more straightaway speed here this morning in qualifying. But the body itself, as you were saying, makes a lot of downforce without the wing setting. But uh, this little car gaggle, there. Dorsey, this looks like, oh, what do you yeah. call it, a sort of ugliness? Yeah, this is some sort of ugliness getting ready to happen. <laughs> An angry little bunch. It's Magnuson, Robin Liddell, Diego Alessi, but they've swapped positions, okay? Then Paul Edwards, Spencer Pompelli's in the mix. Then so too is Lawson Aschenbach, Brian Sellers, Dirk Werner. We ride with the reigning GT champion right now. This GT race could be anybody's from this point on. He's currently in eighth position, so that problem in the pits didn't hurt him he didn't go down a lab he's just a little bit further back in the pack than he should be great to see brian sellers with a good run here and uh he's a stellar teammate replacing andy lally as rj valentine's teammate with the trg group 
qualifying showed us that any one of these teams car combinations are oh, capable of winning oh. somebody shoved off there just got a big hip and shoulder look at how busy it is sellers having to go from one side to the other lawson Aschenbach, very defensive he's trying to put a move on robin liddell and sellers is looking to be opportunistic and grab any position he can this is when your driver you wish this would just stop will you guys just stop this trying to win here ocean back to the inside late on the brakes take the position away from robin liddell this is one of the new cars in gt the auto house pontiac gxpr and brian sellers has been able to go through on liddell verna's lining up for a shot as well dirks i think dirks just watching this stuff going i'm going to let these guys sort this out before i make my move Chris, can you tell us more about the Stevenson car? Well, about one lap ago, Robin Liddell coming down the front straightaway with some smoke coming out of the 57 car. And the team saying right now, no more smoke coming out of that car, but they think he pitched a power steering belt. So the team looking right now, do we have to come into pit lane or can Robin try and manhandle that car around the racetrack? But obviously he's losing some positions out there dealing with the car with uh, no power steering. So they've got a belt here on the pit wall ready for him in pit lane. It's just we're going to have to pay attention see if he makes a dive for it. Now that power steering bed, I think he is coming in right now. As a matter of fact, he is coming toward you. If he did uh, get make contact doors, is there any way that that can then flick the, the belt off? It could, but remember also all of the gravel and so forth yep. that's on this track over there in turn two where people are off. You can get that up in the gears of the belt and pop it off of there. Uh -oh. And drama here for Mamo Gidley as well. That's somebody else's piece, isn't it? Yeah, it is. <laughs> That's <jammed>. not his. <laughs> jammed in the side of his car. So Gidley was having a good run. The Stevenson Pontiac is in. Robin Liddell, who was in the middle of that wonderful scrap. It's now a banner racing one, two. Chris? Well, we can see Robin Liddell up in the air right now. Uh, the team looking under the hood, trying to see exactly what happened. They thought that the car had pitched a power steering belt. At least that's what Robin was telling them. But then also some engine temps were going up. So uh, they might have lost a couple different belts from underneath the hood of this Pontiac. The team uh, doesn't seem like much is going on here other than the team just really looking in there to see what they can do. But Mike Johnson kind of shaking his head, standing up on the pit wall. Well, a lot of times those, a belt will come off like that, and it's right there with close proximity. The other belts jumps in the pulley system. And then you got problems. So what started as a very positive weekend, positive day, it's gone away from them. But they will be contenders this year, Stevenson, that's for sure. You're watching Sports Cars on Speed, the Rolex Sports Car Series. And a former champion, the Rolex 24 winner, Scott Pruitt, and the Telmex Ganassi Lexus leads the way of this race. And doing a nice job of it, too. Turning the fastest lap times, Calvin. Last couple of laps by, Scott's really hauling mail right now. He's so focused. I mean, you watch Scott over the course of a weekend. You see other co-drivers jump out. They'll mingle around the back of the pit box, maybe go for a wander. Scott gets back in the seat, watches the pit times, watches the telemetry. He wants to know everything that's going on every lap of that machine. And that's what 7.1 seconds looks like. That was Pruitt back to Oswaldo Negri. He's got a very healthy lead at the moment over the now Ford-powered Mike Shank Racing Riley. We go on board with Oz. I think something's a little bit amiss on Oz's car. He doesn't have the speed that he's shown earlier in this week. Traffic, oh. Now Did, that car can get out on its own if it just moves. Yeah, Cosmo had such a great run going here. Was running in fourth spot, has got turned around there. If he can get it fired and moved off there. Oh, oh I was hoping that was you'd expect. That is so disappointing for that whole team. Yeah, they needed a good, they really needed a good finish here. This is the V8 5 liter Porsche. He's stuck. essentially a Cayenne motor, which is really coming on strong. Ran at the end part of last year, showed some durability, showed a lot more speed at Daytona, Dorsey, and uh, the Lozano boys looking after that. They know to know to get horsepower of an engine. Yeah, and one of the one of the things that was really hard to do on that engine because it's for a SUV vehicle is it's a it's a tall engine. You know, to get the weight off of the top of it, to get that center of gravity down lower, hard to do. Guess what? They this is their first sprint race. Of course, they they did Salt Lake City last year at the Sun Chaser 1000, then they did the Rolex 24. What that car achieved in those two races has obviously gained some attention because that engine has been taken away, their spare engine has been taken away, and Bill Riley has been working on uh, some adjustments to make that engine fit into a Riley chassis. There's been customer interest in that, in that V8-powered 
Porsche. Well, why not? I mean, it's really the newest engine package in this entire prototype category. And it came out last year, and they're developing a little bit as it goes. And it shows big promise for it to run this well already. And like I say, it is a little high up on the top end of that engine, but they can maybe engineer that out of there. They've also got a legendary name, Gary Nelson who's a consultant with that team as well as the Brumos team and uh, spoke to him yesterday. He said, I think they got a great driver pairing here. Guy Cosmo is really good with the technical feedback. We've got a very hungry young Mark Antoine Cameron who's his co-driver for the races they're going to be contesting this year. But right now he will be disappointed sitting in pit lane, waiting for his chance and watching the car in the gravel trap. All right, let's have a look at what happened up ahead. Can we see it? A bit difficult to decipher yeah, from that view. I'm not sure if he got turned around or whether he just looped it by himself under braking and looked like he could have stopped on the racetrack, Dorsey, and chose to roll the car backwards and just drop those rear wheels into the gravel trap, which has caused his problem here because he could have probably got going again without any damage. Cal, you mentioned a famous name in Gary Nelson helping the Spirit of Daytona team. How about Motorcycle Hall of Fame rider, five times Daytona 200 winner, Mr. Daytona Scott Russell is upstairs, up above us here on the grandstand, spotting for Cosmo and Cameron, and he has the end goal of racing at the Rolex 24 next year. So to do it on bikes and to do it on four wheels, that'll be quite an accomplishment. It's great for him to be up in that position, taking a look now, watching how this all transpires. You know, he's used to the motorcycle end of the business, but this is quite a bit different. And he said that he just wants to learn the language. He needs to understand what they're talking about in terms of debriefing and what the teams are talking about during the race situations as well. These are the spotters up there on top of the, uh, on top of the roof above us. A very smart thing to do here on this, on this Roval is to have a spotter because of the high-speed nature of it and the fact that the driver's visibility around here isn't as good as the guys up on the roof. And that was Scott there with the hat turned around backwards. If you look closely, if you're a motorcycle fan and recognized him, so we'll uh, follow the progress of his uh, desire to race in sports cars. Meanwhile, we settle things down here a little bit again under our another caution period. And Pruitt is coming to pit lane and the whole host of Daytona prototypes as well. This will be the final stop. This will make things close. And if, that, if that looked weird for the people at home that didn't catch it earlier in the broadcast, what happened to Senator Scott Pruitt, the overall leader, is coming on pit lane right here. Those cars that didn't, that went around the pace car, those are GT cars. They're being let by so that the pace car can now pick up the overall leader of GT division. Pressure on the crews here. Must perform. No errors. No mistakes. Nick Johnson, the green car, is going to be turning over to Zonta. Negri Pruitt, they'll stay in. 91 car, don't count out Goosens. They had that massive victory at Salt Lake City the end of last year. Here's the Ganassi crew. Chip's boys are well drilled. So efficient when you watch these boys in the practice sessions. Every casual pit stop isn't casual. It's done the same routine, the same drill. Pruitt stays behind the wheel. Damage to the right front. You see some damage to the splitter there and some contacts and tire marks up front. Also some fluid streaming out from the side of the door from earlier on, so I'm not exactly sure what that was. It may have been where the crew put the cool suit in. Right now, tires are on, wheel in. Pruitt's down and away. Ooh, that was close. Oh. May have been the camera angle, but it looked awfully tight there on pit out. And it was the Gainesco car. Yeah. 99 who beats him out of the pit lane. And I think Oz is all the way up there. Oz is all the way up in front. Negri got out first, only two tyres, and Negri beat both of them out. Yeah, there's your strategy being played out again. Well, Osvaldo Negri said, we can't do the ordinary. The ordinary is not going to get it done in this series any longer. We have to think outside of the box in terms of setup. Certainly Mike Shank and his engineers, they're thinking outside of the box in terms of cutting down on that time on pit lane and grabbing some track position. Let's have a look at this close call between the Gainsco 99, the arch rivals, and the 01 Ganassi car. Ooh. Whoa. If he hadn't lit the tires up and gone sideways, that would have been a contact. Alex Gurney and Scott Pruer, that was a close one. Chris? Well, guys, amazing call by Mike Shank. I said, what'd you do with the two tires? He said, why not? Our tire wear's been great all day. This team set up with a little bit taller first gear getting off that hairpin, so they've really been trying to manage that tire wear all day. And they said the car's in great shape, so Oz got out in front of everybody. Well, one thing about these tires is that they seem to be very quick or quicker for only about 8 to 10 laps. But then they stabilize, and they stay at that level all the way through their stint. So what Shank did right there really is pretty smart. He made up that more than that time 
just doing the two tires. And it would have been right side tires. You've got to come through the oval, of course, and most of the corners on the infield. There'll be a couple of the other, you know, the right-hand turns, they're going to give up a little bit, but the left-hand turns, they'll be in good shape. One thing it does do, Dorsey, and depending on how many laps they had on those old tires, destabilizes it a little bit under braking when you've got different wear on each side, but overall, it's a good, smart move and a common thing to do. Brian, go for it. I just talked to Mike Shank before that stop, and I asked him about Oz being able to work traffic, and he said, remember, we're not the big teams out here, guys. We've got a, we've got a good program here. We want to win races, but we cannot take the chances that they can. So they're running a little bit conservative, although that gamble on tires may be out there a bit, but they're not going to put that car in harm's way. Negre wants to win, that's for sure, but he's not going to wreck the car in the process. Paul Edwards is in in the Banner Racing Pontiac. Yeah, interesting call here, guys. They left Mags out. Paul Edwards, uh, we got to remember, has uh, a few less miles on this car than than Mags. So this team's saying, we can make it on fuel, but we're going to play two different strategies between the cars. This will be the last stop for Edwards. This guy's probably going to have to look for another caution to get Mags in. I think this is smart for the banner guys. Yeah, absolutely. Split your chances here. And what's interesting is that, well, meanwhile, Brian. Haskell in, or Tremblay in, I should say, in the Speed Source Mazda. Tires and fuel down here. It'll be their last stop as well. Things going smoothly right now. The 69 in as well, right behind them. The fuel is in. The tires are on. They should be dropping him and getting out of here soon. Good comeback from the 69. Jeff oh, Siegel has go. done a good job, but there's dramas again here for Tromblay. Well, they had some stationary. kind of clutch issue on the previous pit stop. They are in a second time to top up the fluid reservoir. So maybe I saw the door come open, Dorsey, and they may have had to take care of that once again. Yeah, there's a master cylinder on the passenger side inside the window there where they can take and open that up, put some brake fluid in there, pump it up. Obviously, it does have a fluid leak that's going to continue to leak through the race. Talking about why the 06 Jan Magnussen didn't pit. Maybe they're going for the overall victory. With all of these cautions, they have stayed on the lead lap and right now third overall. <laughs> a long way into this race, Dorsey. So strange things are happening. And you remember where they started? Right at the back of the pack. This has been quite a drive from Leighton Reese and Jan Magnussen. I think it's interesting that, you know, with this new pit procedure and this uh, holding the GTs, letting them go back around and so forth, that it, it's really, really showing us some new strategies down here on pit lane, different guys doing things to try to better their position. I love that two-tire stop by Shank, for one. Joey Hand in the 23, co-driver to Bill Orblin. Orblin told me in the Ruby Tuesday camp, they, their front tire wear was so good that they were, they were highly considering just rears only. Save a little time, work the strategy, and that Ruby Tuesday Porsche sits out in front of the field at the moment. Well, the um, beginning of the story, we talked about tires and the fact that this is only their second race. It's their first sprint race on these tires, and the team's just now getting custom. What can we get away with with this tire that we couldn't get away with before? Not the same testing regulations as in years gone by. Of course, they have the open test at the end of the year here at Homestead, at the beginning of the year at, at Daytona. But private testing rules have changed. Chris? Well, guys, we thought they were splitting the strategy between the 06 and the 07. Actually, just a big mistake. Magnuson, our GT leader, now into pit lane. One lap after everybody else in GT, so he's going to lose a lot of track position on this stop. The team said, you know what, he was just past pit lane when we decided to call him in. So really, they had two laps to set this up and think about it. So big mistake down here by the banner car. Now they really got to put everything in that 07. Yeah, we were joking about going for the overall win. That is a major problem to uh, lose all of this track position with the amount of GT cars in the field as you mentioned at the start of the show course he has a lot of work to do we know he loves this racetrack never forget that bumping and grind he did with <laughs> Max Pappas here a few years ago for the DP lead well he's a bulldog there's no question about that but when you got the parity that you see in GT with a dozen cars or more running in the same second category it makes it really difficult to get by and then you add this Daytona prototype melee that we got going and in GT, we've got a new leader. It is the 80 car, the synergy Porsche of Steve Johnson and former champ car driver, Jan Halen. We'll be back. Another caution period out of the way. The sixth, in fact, as we get ready to go racing, it's Joey Hand for Ruby Tuesday Championship Racing. The Porsche-powered Crawford leads the way. Are they rolling the dice with strategy? The last time they did it to a big extent, they were victorious at Laguna Seca, Mazda Raceway Laguna Seca last year. Those are lap cars behind him. Max Angelelli, and about the fifth car in line, I believe, maybe sixth car, fifth car right there. Oswaldo Negri is second place, followed by Pruitt. And then Gurney, 
Zonta is in the mix. Matt Plum is there for Rumbum Seagull Sport Racing. Goosens is there. Don't discount Joao Barbosa either for Brumos in the 59. And Brian Frizzell is behind the wheel of the 61. Zonta's got a round gurney, so he's making a move in that green Lola. 38 Formula One Grand Prix for Ricardo Zonta. Now he's a full-time sports car racer. And he's in the mix. He's also going to be running at 24 Hours of Le Mans with Peugeot. Big factory Whoa, effort there. Look, look at Plum. This. this is Matt Plum. Forceful on the inside in the BMW power. Great, great move there. He read that perfectly, but it doesn't get the launch, Calvin, off the corner. Wow, what a performance he had at Daytona, leading many laps there. And this is a real shot in the arm for this team as well. Showing their strength. Inside, takes the low line. The number seven, Rum Bum Riley. Matt Plum, what a surprise. Very unassuming, been doing great things in GT, making the big step up to Daytona prototypes, and it fits. I said to him, how was it to lead the Rolex 24 earlier this year? He said, I didn't want to come in and pit. <laughs> he said, I just wanted to stay out there. Pruitt on Negri. Plenty of pressure here, but it's not for the lead at the moment. Joey Hand is the race leader over, over Antonio Garcia. And then these boys. The Crown Royal Special Reserve car sits second at the moment. How's it all going to shake out on strategy, though? Does the Ruby Tuesday Porsche have enough? Don't discount the 59 Brumos Porsche with Jao Barbosa in there. He's right now back up on that lead lap, sitting in a good position, sitting in ninth place, but he's at the tail of this back. I misspoke earlier saying that Negri was second. Obviously, Garcia is running second. A great run for Eddie Chivas, boys. Done a lot of work with that fab car, now named the Coyote, after the legend AJ Foyt. Tell us more about the 23, Brian. Lee, I just spoke with Bill Auberlin, who got out of that car, and he said it was very well balanced throughout the first three cautions, but at the fourth caution, it got to be very loose. They came in on this last stop, put new tires on it. Joey Ann got behind the wheel, and they are rolling the dice big time here on fuel. Remember, they won a race last year with at Laguna Seca on fuel mileage. The question is, can they do it again here, and will the balance stay underneath Joey Hand to the checkers? Yeah, last, last year, Dawson, was uh, Jörg Bergmeister and Patrick Long, wasn't it? And they almost didn't have enough fuel in the car to get home after the checkers. And the Ruby Tuesday team still waiting for the new bodywork from Crawford. This is still the last year of bodywork on the car, so they really are desperate for any aero help that they can get that these other cars that they're racing against already have. Guess where they think they'll get it? Laguna Seca. <laughs> <laughs> Won't have enough time before Mexico or VIR. Are we expecting to see the Let new body Let him go, work? Joey. Let him go. Max yeah. Ange Angelelli is on a charge here. He's many laps down. Got a quick race going. <laughs> Joey's <laughs> fighting him. Doesn't need to fight him. I'd be on the radio and say, Joey, no, he's not. He's not what you want, man. That's a lap car. That's the, the uh, Delara. It's Hand Garcia, Negri, Pruitt, Zonta, the top five. Alex Gurney, Matt Plum, Mark Goosen, Joao Barbosa, and Brian Frizzell in the A Motorsport Ford. Well, a lot of gambles being played here, Calvin, strategy-wise. Well, the boys at Ruby Tuesday have a great record here. They have won the event before. Bill Orblin won the race here last year with Matt Alhadov, so there's a lot of great momentum from within that team here at Homestead. Here we see a great battle going on, though. There's Negri and Pruitt start to hone in on Garcia, who does hold down the second spot. Took over from former F1 test driver Matteo Bobby made his name in the FIA GT Championship but Garcia who we've got to know so well and we've got another full course caution the yellow flies again what for this time we will find out well the key is going to be how the 16 and the 23 feel they are in terms of mileage and if they're going to need a splash or not this will probably be a debris situation I don't see any cars that have had any uh, any problems and they're very like I said it before they're going to there's your debris as a matter of fact they're going to really watch these uh, debris situations with this new tire and with these cars and not allow that debris to go out there and, and cut tires or go up and get in the windshield of these cars. We're going too fast nowadays. Ooh, look at it. It's right up there online. So this is our seventh full course yellow of the day. Seventh yellow. It has been a very much stop-start affair. And when they do get racing, there has been some close competition. Remember, when we started this race, it's two and three-quarter hours or 250 miles, whichever comes first. 
What's it going to be? Well, it's going to be time now with all of these yellows. We're not going to get to that 109 lap mark. So this is where the calculators need to come out from all of the teams in terms of, no, we do not need to make another 37 laps. We need to look at the time. Okay, he's got the overall leader. The pace car does. The pit lane will be closed. Nobody should be coming to the pits. If they do, there'll be a penalty until they go by one time. The GT cars will be waved around here on this lap. Chris? Well, guys, I just checked in with uh, Eddie Cheever, and he said, you know, we didn't come in on that last stop, so we're really rolling the dice here. And this was before this caution came out. He said it's going to be very, very tight. We're not going to – we're going to try and stay out there. But now this caution and hopefully maybe a couple more, it's going to get that car to the end. He was also talking to his driver saying, you know, you're doing some great times out there. Just stay up with that 23 car. But obviously that car it has quite a few more laps on its tires. So you look at the 60 and the 01 behind it. They might be right on its tail once we go back to green. Brian. Well, Bill Auberlin, he should know what's going to happen with the 23 car. Chris, Bill, we were just talking. This yellow is good because you save fuel, but it's bad because the rest of the pack catches up to you. Does Joey have enough? Uh, well, we're really, really close. It's going to, I mean, we did this race last year. I won it last year with Siegel Sport. Alex won it the year before. We know there's a lot of accents. We know there's a lot of yellows. So we took a gamble a little earlier, and it's coming our way. We don't, I don't know if we got the pace for Pruitt or Negri, but Joey is going to give it his all. I got to, we got to get this thing over with. I need a triple prime burger from Ruby Tuesday like fast. <laughs> <laughs> how, how wide can a Porsche Crawford be? Uh, well, and for how long? I told Joey, Joey, do to them what you did to me in Ohio like four <laughs> years ago. And he's like, oh, I like it. Kind of, but I mean, he can, he can be wide, but I think we just don't have the pace down the straight right now. Just want to say hi to Yvette at home and everybody, and we're just going to fight this as hard as we can. Well, they're playing their cards, guys. We'll have to wait till the checker to see what happens. Will a triple prime burger give you extra downforce? <laughs> I think it probably would. <laughs> I think it might. Chatting with Alex Job recently, and he said that uh, there was a lot of conjecture as to who was going to get that second seat at Ruby Tuesday racing alongside Bill Orblin. Of course, everyone would like to drive alongside Bill. He's so fast, got such a great resume. And there was a lot of talk that he may have gone for a European driver or something like that. Joey Hand really put his case forward. And Alex said, you know what? In the first test session, Joey Hand, just his value came through. And he said, I'm so glad I hired him. Well, the neat thing was he'd already done some testing with the Crawford group. So they certainly recommended him. And he and Bill have raced together together for so many years now. There's a great chemistry there. Spoke to the crew this morning about how they're driving with this team. They just said they feel the same things with the race car. You plug either one in, you're going to get the same feedback. And sometimes that's not the case, though. So you put another co-driver in, they give you a different line of thinking and which direction to go with the setup. And you know, he's one of these drivers that can just disappear because he's an American driver and he doesn't have the fancy name or something. Some people just push him to the side. He's a heck of a race car driver. He deserves that shot. We believe this is a stop and go plus one minute penalty for uh, Ricardo Zonta. Well, that's well he got coast. around the 99 machine somewhere, somehow, and this is <laughs> devastating because they had a great top five run going here. Now, that's that just will kill him. Pit equipment was attached at the last restop, at the last um, uh, uh, pit stop, I should say. That's a pit infraction penalty. Now, those are all spelled out to the teams. The teams know if you leave catch can on you leave a gas hose on you pull off this is the penalty well you're not allowed to service the car into yellow but in terms of cleaning the windshield and stuff like that that's kind of a gray area and i'm not sure what the guys are doing inside the cockpit there right now brian well we talked earlier about oswaldo negri not taking chances and not gambling in traffic mike you didn't say anything about not gambling on pit calls and stuff like that you went for the two tires is that going to be enough you think I don't know. I think it will be, though. We had to make a choice on track position. We took it. It's just like racing at Martinsville, but the Westfield insurance car is good, strong. We're trying to be conservative in traffic. We hit a GT car early on. We'll see what happens here at the end. He's strong, though. Well, the other thing you told me was, yeah, we can't afford to do that. A top five finish is like a win for us. That's great. We're running well. But the call you made wasn't one to finish on the podium. The call you made was one to go for the victory. Uh, this is a gutsy call by Dave Cannon, the engineer. Two tires on the right side, and uh, we'll see. Got us the position. Let's see what happens at the end. You heard him, guys. They're gambling. We'll see what happens at the checkers. Hole at the Rolex 24, sixth at the Rolex 24. They were hoping for higher than that. Let's see what they can achieve today. We always get asked about this a lot, walking around the pit and paddock area, but now you can get your own. The Speed Swag Store is open. SpeedTV.com, keyword swag, jackets, hats, T-shirts. The only thing they don't sell is Dorsey Schrader hair gel. Someone asked me whether Hair they can buy the lifts that you have in your shoes, mate. <laughs> <laughs> Notice that at the beginning Don't of the show. Don't you start on me. It goes both ways. I want a bobblehead. <laughs> <laughs> you are a bobblehead. <laughs>
just look in the mirror, right? Wow, this has been the theme of the day, hasn't it? Yellow, yellow, yellow. Yes, There's going to be some action here, though. I mean, everyone wants this victory in the worst possible way. joey has got to hang on there. Garcia in the Coyote, he's looking strong in terms of track position. Does he have the pace? Negri, I mean, so strong at Daytona. Fastest in the two-day test they had here a month ago. Quick in practice sessions here. I mean, he's hungry for that victory. Nothing like starting a new season as the defending champion. Let's hear from one now. John Fogarty down here. John, obviously the season's starting much better this year than it did last year. Second at the Rolex 24, running well here. Two races you guys struggled in, but I know that you want to get back to the form that you guys finished the season on. What's it going to take to come to grips with these Pirelli tires? Uh, I think a lot of it's just the circuits. I think when we go to Mexico City, we're going to be in really good shape. Um, and we're doing great here as well. It's, you know, it's Gainesco Auto Insurance 300, and we've been leading, and we got a sh shot at winning this one. Uh, Unfortunately, we had a, a pit official who uh, had a bit of a death wish and blocked us from uh, from our last splash and go, which caused us to fall behind uh, 60 in the 01. But Alex is going to do his best, and we got a shot. Well, and they're looking for a championship. Remember, last year did not start well, but they finished the season with the championship, so they're sitting in a much better spot right now. And you heard John say, "Hey, we got a lot of fans here. 650 guests from Gainesco at the track this weekend, the most ever brought to event by a sponsor." Guys, and the interesting thing, Brian, is that Homestead Miami Speedway has not been kind to Gainesco Racing. Last year they finished 11th. The year before, Gurney and Jimmy Vassa finished 6th. So to be on the podium would be a huge boost here at Homestead. Two cars up front here at Homestead Miami Speedway that are a little dubious about whether they have enough to go to the end. And they have got a whole host of charges right behind. End of yet another caution period. Green flies, let's do it. Negri pops out of the line, looks for an inside run on Antonio Garcia. Joey Hand for Ruby Tuesday Racing leads the way. Pruitt looking for a line. Gurney looking for a line. This will be close. Matt Plum is in the mix as well. He is very aggressive and Goosens is there as well. So Plum and Goosens look for them to get aggressive here in these opening laps following this caution. The Portuguese driver Joao Barbosa is right behind as well. He's looking at Goosens. Brian Frizzell, Bill Lester for Southern Motorsports gets himself into the top 10 also. This will be an incredible race to the end. They're all on the lead lap, and we've got just a little over 40 minutes remaining. Well, Guso and Barbosa don't need to mess with each other. They need to work together, as you see right now. Here we go. This is Plum, Matt Plum on the inside of Alex Gurney. The move sticks this time. Here comes Goosens up the inside, try to get a launch. That's impressive stuff by Matt Plum. They haven't had the smoothest of weekends. They don't have the resources that some of the other big teams, so they are strutting this stuff. They're looking for support. What a great run for the seven machine. Well, Matt Plum has done many years of a variety of racing, including Speed World Challenge, but nothing put him on the map more than what he did at the Rolex 24 at Daytona. And he's continuing it now in the Rum Bum Riley with BMW Power. Only two BMW powered cars in this field. Pruitt gets by Garcia. And so too does Negri. That was a blast down the inside. One thing about that BMW power plant in the number seven machine has a lot of hours on that. Spoke to Steve Dynan yesterday, and he was over by the two machine. He said, I'm a little bit concerned about the boys with the seven car. They've got a lot of hours on that engine. And word through, as you mentioned earlier, Cal, as Plump goes by Garcia, we have now been told officially that this race goes by time. 38 minutes remaining. Steve Dynan builds the engines for the BMW power plants in this field. He's happy to have more than one this year. Gurney looks to the inside. What will Goosens do here? He tucks to the outside. Can he get the power down first? Going to be a drag race off turn eight. Outside usually gives you better grip. To You're the running. left will be Gurney. And there's a car coming up. He's going to get by. Pruitt's on the inside of Negri. Gets that position back that he lost on pit road. No love lost here between no. these two boys. Lexus power looks really good on that. Pruitt getting a lot of power down when he gets off those straightaways. Started the weekend with a very low downforce setup and had to go to what Timmy Keane, team manager, described to me this morning as a medium downforce setup on the car. Pruitt said, come on, let's trim some more out. He said, no, you got to run up medium. Negri really getting in the way of Plum. Plum wants by and Negri being he very is, defensive. He is turning some incredible lap times. Matt Plum doing very well and will be a contender. They're all chasing. Joey Hand, who has a two and a half second lead in the Porsche powered Crawford, the only car in that configuration in this race. 
Pruitt is the man to watch. Remember that the Telmex Ganassi team won the Rolex 24 with the old Riley bodywork. This is the first race for them with the new Riley bodywork. Scott said, to be honest, I can't really feel a difference, but you've got to have the new stuff if you want to be up front. Well, it's trouble now for Joey, though, isn't it? I mean, once Pruitt's got clear of that pack, the, I think that is the fastest car on the field right now. Well, look at Plum, though. He's now right on the gearbox of Negri as well. That two-tire call was a very brave move, gave them track position, but right now you have to wonder, is Negri struggling for grip just a little bit, but still a long ways to go, 38 minutes and plus. Both Riley chassis cars, the front one is powered by Ford. The next one, with Matt Plum in it, is BMW power. Porsche, Lexus, Ford, BMW, and the next one in line is a Pontiac. Great diversity amongst the power plants. Seven car as well of the defending champions here, so they have a good setup for this machine. Currently running in fourth. Joey Hand has been caught by Scott Pruitt. And very quickly, very effectively. Needs to get by, though. Two different things. Let's hear from the man who owns the Telmex car. Chip Ganassi down here. We're just talking to him. Big smiles on your face. You got a car in the, in the event with Dario, which is good. He made the field. You got a car on the pole tomorrow for the IndyCar, tonight for the IndyCar race right now. Scott Pruitt having a great run. You guys seem to have run so well here in the past, but track is really pretty shady today, to say the least, with a lot of debris on it. Scott seems to be having things his way. Well, you know, Brian, in, in, in our Grand Am team, we owe a lot to uh, Toyota and Lexus TRD people out there. They've done a great job in giving us an engine this year. Makes us a little more competitive here. And, uh, you know, last year we were behind the eight ball a little bit, but uh, we're back to... Uh, Back to top form here with the Telmex team. We're pretty happy. You fly out of here tonight with a trophy for the IndyCar race and the Rolex Sports Car Series event here at Homestead. You can be happy? Oh, on my way to Martinsville. <laughs> um, yes, I'd be happy, but I'm on my way to Martinsville. Uh, Chip always wants more, guys. He's greedy. Well, he just got it, Brian. Pruitt just took the lead, and he talked about the support he's got from Lexus. They made some changes at the end of last year, remember, when we went into that finale. A little controversial, but the Lexus did get a bigger lift cam, bigger ports in that motor. We're talking to Pruitt this weekend. He said it really wasn't very drivable at Daytona. They've made some changes to the electronics. Now it's really got a much better workable torque curve, Dorsey. And you see it right there. That's why I said, you look at that car when it comes off the tighter corners onto the two straightaways, the massive straightaways, and it really launches off the low end. It must have a lot of grip down low. Scott Pruitt turned 48 this past Monday. He started go-kart racing at the age of eight. 40 years of motor racing in North America and is still as strong and as fast as ever. Let's take you back, show you the replay pass for the lead. It was one of the Black Forest Mustangs on the left-hand side of your screen. Joey Hand in the middle. Power play. That's horsepower right there. And Oblin said, he said, we just don't seem to have the straightaway speed here this weekend, which again plays in a downforce. It's not just the strict power coming from the engine. Just under and 34 minutes to go in this race. And certainly drag has been addressed on these new body works. That they, you see with the Riley, it's got a lot reduced drag, which on this type of a racetrack plays huge dividend. The Crawford has such a great record here. In fact, they've won this race three times, twice with Andy Wallace. So uh, they have a great record here. And, of course, with the Ruby Tuesday machine a couple of years ago with Rockefeller and Long. Let's talk more about the 60, Chris. Well, it's pretty obvious that the 01 car better on four new tires than the 60s two new tires. I just asked Mike Shank about that. He said, you know what? Just be patient. We got 35 minutes of racing left. Once these guys get 10 to 15 laps under their belt, I think this thing's really going to stabilize, and that's when our car is going to get strong. So they're just telling Oz right now, be patient out there, brothers. These laps kick off. We think that 01 car is going to start coming back to you. That's what I talked about before. Most of these cars on fresh tires have 10 to 15 laps, at the most 15, of a sweet spot on the tire where it produces faster lap speeds. However, once it gets beyond that, it drops back into the realm of what can, uh, Negri should be running with right now. Need to switch gears to GT. Paul Edwards is the class leader for Banner Racing. Second is Spencer Pompelli. Third is Sylvain Tremblay. So it's Pontiac, Porsche, Mazda. Then the defending champion, Dirk Werner. Then a newcomer to sports car racing, Jan Halen, is in the top five. Magnussen is in sixth. Aschenbach is uh, seventh. Jeff Siegel. And then Jean-Francois Dumoulin for the Black Forest Mustang team. Great recovery by Magnuson. He's running in the mid-19s, everyone else in the 20s. So he's about a second a lap faster. He'll be fired up after that pit <laughs> call that brought him in a lap after everyone else and dropped him with track position. Front running Porsche there is Spencer Pompelli in the 67 team with a new guy, Tim George Jr. And they have come together very nicely. 
The Ferrari behind him is not for position. That's Ed Zabinski, and uh, he and Ed Tucker had a little misfortune earlier on in their new 430 Ferrari. They went off track, caused one of the yellows. But they're on a uh, they're on a learning curve. Long way to go, but they're very excited. I think they're going to do about seven races this year in the Rolex GT Series. Oh, a crash here. That's the nine car. That is Brian Tuttle. Tuttle is in the wall backwards. Both doors open. So it's coming off turn five, isn't it, Dawson? Yeah, I believe it is. You see the skid marks, I think. They're going across right there. And this will bring out our eighth four-course yellow. Somebody say yellow? Yeah. <laughs> that is a record, by the way. The record here, at least last year, we had seven four-course yellows. This will be number eight. Whoa. And we got damage on this Porsche. And that's Jan Halen. Halen. Top five uh, GT car. That's not damage. That's oil smoke. That is definitely engine it's related. A shame sharing this car with big Stevie Johnson, ex NFL star, and Jan Halen. He is a real talent, this young man. Did some champ car events last year at a podium finish over in Europe. So, very good, strong driver. In fact, he's uh, living right near Pat Long. They do a lot of training together, both under the management team of uh, Sean Jones. So, good young driver, this man. This is Brian Tuttle. And he needs some rescuing. He needs some help. This is the cause of our most recent yellow. Brian? Just checked in with Cole Scroggum. They don't know exactly what the deal is with the number 80 of Ian Halen right now. But when I saw him come down the front straightaway, just about the line is where the smoke started. And it increased all the way into one. And Dorsey, as you said, that is not good. It looked like oil smoke to me as well. He's headed to pit road yeah. right now. And as he makes the run, long run down here, that smoke is not just kind of white colored. It's got some blue tint to it. And that looks like oil to me as well. I saw it come out the exhaust that time, Brian. We had a good shot of the back of it. So that engine, I think, has seen its last bay. Halen brings the car to the Synergy pit. We have uh, just under half an hour remaining in this race. And we are currently under our eight caution. Cole Scroggum's boys go to work. We'll try and identify what that problem is while we're under caution and while we ha have this moment I, I would like to uh, give a special mention to as you can imagine the sports car racing community is very close I'd like to give a special mention to Jason Workman a uh, dear friend of many here in the paddock particularly Spencer Pumpelli who's doing very well in the GT class Jason was involved in a freak accident at Moroso Motorsports Park recently in mid-February where he was actually the passenger in a car it was a ride and drive type program and uh, a freak storm blew up he was hit by a rather large i understand it was a rather large water barrel that was holding down some tents and uh, he was quite severely injured they put him into a medically induced coma he is making progress but it's quite slow and to all of uh, jason's friends and family we wish him a, a speedy recovery Yeah, they're not addressing anything right now, are they? I mean, they're just put some jack stands underneath, so they're going to crawl under the rear end of this. Brian's there. Yeah, it smelled like oil when we came in, and you can see uh, a little bit of spray all over the back of the car. But when you look at the ground underneath the car as he pulled into a stop, there's a long trail of oil. And I got to believe that this oil got left all the way around the racetrack. As a matter of fact, as I'm standing here behind it on the paint stripe for the pit stall just moments ago, I stepped on it. It was very slick. Steve Johnson just looked at me and gave me the slash across the throat. They're done. Mm. Now, take a look at when this engine, as we think it is, expired. Ooh. It's up in front of you there, and watch this windscreen get completely covered. Yeah, Lawson Oshenbag is going to have his hands full, literally, here, coming up to the next corner and then seeing for the rest of this event. That's just a terrible thing to have happen. You dare not turn on a windshield wiper with that oil there. That'll be the end of it. Particularly in this bright sunlight, he's going to have some issues. So while they're done, let's uh, just revise how we sit at the moment with less than half an hour to go. Pruitt is a leader, Hand is second, Negri is third, Matt Plum is fourth, Mark Goosens is fifth, Gurney sixth, Joao Barbosa for Brumos seventh, Bill Lester, former NASCAR Craftsman Truck Series racer, is eighth. Antonio Garcia, nine. And Paul Edwards, the top GT car, is in the top ten. Brian? Max Angelelli sits behind the wheel of the SunTrust Delar. The crew looking at the back of that car right now. It's going to go up on jack stands, and they're re-examining the suspension in the back after that big hit with David Donahue early on. So right now, just precautionary. They want to make sure this car finishes the race. You don't want to go out and leave something undone or have something else break while you're out there. 
and trash the whole car. Remember, we've got a long season ahead of us, and these guys have worked so hard to put this car together. They don't need to do any more damage to it than has already been done today. In addition, this is a great test bed for these guys. They haven't done a lot of testing, so the more miles they get on this car today, they'll, the more they will learn about it. I was listening to the scanner moments ago, and Max Angelelli, as we all know, can be a very excitable boy, and he was even working through traffic as many laps down as they are. So Angelelli still has the fire, and they'll get this Delara back on track. Meanwhile, as he heads out of the pits, I will tell you there was a lot of oil behind the 80 car, as I was mentioning, and it leads me to wonder how much of it is out on the racetrack. And, Brian, it's a good point you make about Ange Angelelli's determination because currently the SunTrust Delara is in 16th place. He would get 15 points for that. How many times have we seen championship decided by one or two points? It's all a points game. And we've got a lot to talk about this race because it's been punctuated by eight caution periods. We're in the eighth one right now, but things are looking good for the 07 team. 36 laps of 85 behind that pace car tells the story. It really changes everybody because whatever strategies you were playing, it just keeps negating away at it, doesn't it? Chris, tell us more. Well, right behind the 07, you've got to look at 67. Really kind of a sleeper here today. Spencer Pompelli starting back in 16th, running all the way up to second now. That car is good on fuel and tires. At Daytona, we talked about the massive undertaking Kevin Buckler had with seven cars. Well, another big weekend for him. He's got nine cars running at three different racetracks around the country. Now, the one good thing is Kevin already has a win this week. We know that he makes wine, and he entered one of his Pinot Noirs in the annual wine shootout, Pinot Noir shootout in California. He came home a winner, perfect TRT, TRG fashion. Nice work, Kevin. Nice work. Love to sample it, boys. Yeah, <laughs> I was about to say. All right, let's go racing. Here we go. Will this be for the final time? 18 and three-quarter minutes to go. Can Pruitt do it? Can this man, Oswaldo Negri, do it? And has Joey Hand got enough? Look at that. Joey Hand, very aggressive there. Probing, looking for a way around Pruitt. Hugh Plum back and forth, all, all over the back to Ozzy, too. Oh, we're hearing bad news for the three machine. Bill Lester is having a great run well inside the top ten. Apparently may have jumped the restart. May have to do a drive-through. That's a shame. They were running pretty well in eighth place. That's Matt Plum there in the Rum Bum BMW, just ahead of Mark Goosens and ahead of the defending DP co-champion Alex Gurney. Anyone could win this, but Pruitt looks the strongest at the moment, doesn't he? See how these tires come back in now that everybody's made their scrub down issue and then back on the green. Ryan Dial looking for an inside option, trying to make up places after a little hiccup with that car, some damage on it earlier. I asked him why he's so good in Daytona prototypes. He said, ever since I first got in one at the Rolex 24, I just seemed to fit. I just liked it. Got to grips with it very quickly. Very close to driving for Aston Martin at Le Mans this summer, but fellow Aussie actually got the ride. We're hearing that Brabs may be driving there now instead of uh, Ryan. He had a successful test over in Europe a couple of weeks ago. And so he should. He won Le Mans last year. <laughs> Brian, what do you have? Lee, it's good to see the number 59 Brumos Porsche Fab Car up there. Joao Barbosa running seventh right now. But the man that we're used to seeing in the driving suit and behind the wheel of that car, Hurley Haywood. Hurley, we've chronicled it in the past that you've stepped out of the cockpit this year to be the manage it, management there at Brumos. How difficult is it for you to sit here on this timing stand and watch things unfold? It's it's hard. It's it's really hard. I want to be out there. But, you know, it's, it's good to be up here. The Brumos cars have done great all weekend. We started out great. And then both cars had a problem. But we've fought our way back. The 58 car is out running. Unbelievable. And uh, the 58 car came back from a two-lap deficit to, to run seven, so we're doing all right. It's great to see Brumos have their strength back over the last couple of years. Some great performances put in towards the end of the season. Is that a lot to do with some of the management style and the, and the philosophy that you bring to it? Well, it's not so much me, but it's, it's certainly the management. We've got a great group of guys. It's, they're really they're talented. They're some of the best guys in the business. And they've really turned the, the thought process of what we do around. So we're a really a team that works well together and we can, you know, hopefully overcome and get in that victory cir circle sooner or later.
It's great to see the 58 car start from the pole, but then David had the problem. We saw the broken suspension piece. Was that the cause of the incident or just something that happened in the course of the incident? I really don't know. I, I you know, saw the thing on the, on the uh, tape delay, but it just looked like he spun, and I think the, the suspension broke after he, after he spun. He hit that uh, berm, and that was it. So it was a miracle they got the car back because it tore it up pretty good. Great to see Hurley Haywood still here at Brumos, this time taking his philosophy to the management role, guys. It seems to be working. Truett leads the way. You may remember I mentioned earlier, there has never been a repeat winner here at Homestead Miami Speedway in this springtime race. Ganassi has never won here in Daytona Prototypes. It could be Pruitt Rojas for the first two rounds of the year. Pruitt 15 minutes to go. Pruitt has the hammer down. He just laid down a lap just one-tenth of a second off his previous best. So that was one second faster than Joey Hand. He backs that up with a 14-1, still a half a second clear of the rest of the pack. And what Scott will try to do right now is open up a gap. He's already opening up a gap, but get a little bit more. He's in a safe zone right now. Once he gets it out to where he's got it right now, he can mirror drive, Calvin. Look in the rearview mirror and just judge his speed off of who's behind him. Because you never know. You get another caution. You don't want to use those tires up. Just manage that cushion. So if you encounter traffic, you don't have to defend. Cal, we may get another caution because this car has just blown up on the front straight. Antonio Garcia brings the Chiba Racing Pontiac to a stop. The Coyote is. is done for the day. Right bank, you can see the right exhaust smoking something on the right side cylinders going bad. Full course caution for the ninth time. And this is all helping out Joey Ham. We spoke to Bill Orblin just a few laps ago about a previous caution. He said, well, this should get us a lot closer. And two more cautions since then, you'd have to be thinking that the Ruby Tuesday squad are pretty good, in pretty good shape regarding fuel mileage now. What happened? was the uh, body language there to Antonio Garcia. Top 10 was on offer, but it is not to be for Eddie Cheever's boys. And there you see the left side exhaust belching the smoke out both sides now. <laughs> and someone with a fire extinguisher must have saw what he thought was some flame back there, so he's put that out. So Pruitt is in the box seat. 13 and a half minutes to go. It will be several minutes by the time we get this cleaned up. This is looking good. It's going to be maybe a three or four lap shootout to the end for round two of the Rolex Sports Car Series, the Gainsco Grand Prix of Miami. The Gainsco car is back in sixth place. Chris? Well, guys, back at that GT leader, we've had a lot of hot action on the racetrack, and it's been a hot day here in Florida. One thing keeping the 07 and the 06 cool this weekend is a new air conditioning system. T typically on these cars, what we see them running is a cool box, which is essentially just a cooler with ice in it, and they blow air through it, and then through uh, tubing goes onto the driver. This team going with something a little bit different, what we see with the Corvettes in the ALMS series, a similar system that they developed in-house. They've got a compressor, a condenser, and also a refrigerator running off the power of the drive shaft. So uh, a new system for this team to work with. The drivers absolutely love it, blowing cool air on their backs and into their helmets. Now, the one thing that this system does do is it does pull a little bit of mechanical power away. They haven't been able to figure exactly what type of uh, horsepower depletion they're looking at. But the, the nice thing is, is when they do cool off, they can turn that system down. At that point in time, that pulley just runs at free wheels, so it doesn't pull motor away. So kind of a, a push-to-pass type system for those guys, too. But uh, keep, definitely keeping their drivers cool and running up front. It'll come in handy at the next round, too, at uh, Mexico City in just three weeks' time. Don't go away. The closing stages of round two of the Rolex Series when we come back. our way back to green flag racing and here we go it is on and we've got the top three in the race all together it's diaz pappas and yad magnus and look at matt pappas almost hits his teammate hard on the brakes down into one had no oh, oh he's gone road. diaz is gone can you believe it whilst in the lead now oh, look now at pappas getting, defend yeah, now, we're, now we're getting the wide car out we're counting Not down the happen. second flag magnus and almost contact oh, Side by side. These guys are driving each other off the road. Oh, and still Magnus, and they bash. They continue to bash. Boy, oh boy, we saw the 27 in this last year with David Donahue, but it was Taze at the wheel. Now Magnus and Pappas are giving it to each other. Now you got to watch knocking the valve stems off because they're going to both have flat tires here. And their top speed hit. That's oh. stupid. <laughs>
That's just a little bit too much. I, I would think they need a reprimand. The this door's, is going to win. There's a wreck. Season, and it has. Both of boy, them. Boy, oh boy. And our man Wallace goes to the lead. That's like what they deserve. Both of them deserve to be right where they are. That was wild stuff on the track. That just seems like yesterday. <laughs> Great stuff. And Magnuson having another strong run here. He's recovered from that pit stop up to fourth and uh, not that far behind. Fellow banner boy, Paul Edwards. Of course, that was back in 04, and you're right. It doesn't seem that long back, but it was for the people who just tuned in. That wasn't live. That was... Ganassi were going for the win then. They are going for the win again today. Brian, what do you have for us? All right, boys, let me up you day, update you on the 60 and the 23. Those two cars really going at it when the full course caution came out. Oswaldo Negre in the 60. Remember, they took those right side tires. So I talked to Mike Schenk. He said these Pirellis really respond well to getting cooled down on these cautions. So they needed that to mount the charge on Joey Hand. I checked in with Bill Arberley. He said the, the yellow does great things for us as far as fuel we are good to go unfortunately we're a sitting duck it's going to be good because the tires will cool a little bit but we just don't think we've got much of a car to defend off negre we need this yellow to last a long time if we only have two or three laps left maybe joey can hold on but i can tell you guys the run to the checkered for those two cars is going to be intense and then you look at matt plum right behind him and you know that he's been very aggressive today it should be a great one yeah, I think this is going to be exciting few laps here, Dorsey, when we do finally get that green. Hopefully it'll be the last green flag we see today. <laughs> too much yellow. Tough to get a rhythm here, but, you know, car down on the front straightaway, just too dangerous to leave it there, even though he pulled it off. Plus, you got to wonder how much oil came out. You know, we knew yep. engine expired on that. We could see that it was really bad in one tailpipe. So, you know, some amount of fluid did come out of that. Of course, we always think about the excitement and the speed of racing, but there is another very important side. That is the safety side. And our Chris Neville took a look at a wonderful new innovation. Over the years, we've seen a lot of great safety systems developed in motorsports. We've seen crush boxes and attenuators. We've seen roof flaps and the Hans device. And even when Dorsey was racing, the full face helmet and the fire suit were considered cutting edge. Now, Shock Doctor has introduced what's called the eject helmet removal system. Now, when a driver gets in a bad accident and has a neck collar on, it's still difficult for EMTs to remove that helmet without torquing the neck a little bit. Now, what the eject system is, it's a little bag that sits inside the helmet, and when an EMT needs to get the helmet off, they attach a little bulb syringe to that tube, and then they can just inflate that helmet off the driver's head, decreasing any further C-spine injury. Another innovative and relevant tool to make not only professional motorsports, but recreational motorsports safer. That's an interesting concept right there. You know, he's it's, it, it's right. When you got an injury like that, getting the helmet off the head, those fit quite tightly, and you really have to yank and pull on it. So that's something new that I haven't seen before, you know, to help to uh, push the helmet up off so the guys don't have to pull away on the guy's head on the neck. Very, very clever as we go inside and look at the helmets One. of Lawson Aschenbach, and this is uh, Sylvain Tremblay in the number 70 castrol rx8 for speed source he's in the thick of a great gt battle here paul edwards currently leads from spencer pompelli but sylvain is running third coming off the back of that victory at the daytona 24-hour race and magnuson is on a charge currently fourth and dirk vernon last year's champion fifth so everything to play for here in gt and let's not forget about spencer pompelli sitting second his new co-driver tim george jr did a good job early on now spencer is behind the wheel to take it home and there's only seven minutes to go this is going to be a scramble well this is usually when i say the crash or the wreck is on when they drop the green this time all the nonsense goes away all the things that you've done up to today up to this point today makes no difference the next six and a half minutes have you trademarked assorted ugliness yet <laughs> well assorted ugliness is ha going to happen again <laughs> very shortly in about not very long <laughs> <laughs> don't trip yourself up before we get home yeah. doors <laughs> all right lights are off on the g8 we're ready to roll taking you home all the way to the checkered flag can pruitt do it for the first time not only for himself and rojas here but also for lexus and ganassi let's roll all the way home here at homestead miami speedway the final run round two of the rolex series pruitt leads hand leads negri matt plummer's in the mix goosen's ahead of the champ alex gurney Oh, very aggressive there. Gurney has to defend the inside line going into turn two. Joey uh, Hand made up a lot of ground in that break zone back there too, so 
watch for him when we get off that turn six on the way down to turn eight. Take nothing away from them, but they would admit themselves. Alex Joe, Bill Orblin, and Joey Hand, they would not have expected to be in this position at this stage in the race. The car was just not handling the way they wanted it to. This is a big surprise. Oh, they'll Joey's take up. it. Joey goes wide, spreads debris everywhere, but maintains second. Yeah, but how Look dirty is Look at Matt Plum to the inside of Negri. Great position, great block pass from Matt Plum. Here comes Goosen. Oh, he just doesn't get the power down. Goosen's on the left of these pair. Oz is not afraid to mix it up, and they do mix it up. Almost Pappas Magnuson style. And Plum's not used to that, I guarantee you. He's new to this type of thing. He's liking it, though. <laughs> yeah, he probably is. Who's got the ponies? The BMW Ford. versus Ford. Ford to the left, BMW to the right, Dine and Power. Oswaldo's got the preferred line. He will not back off. Matt does. And through comes Goosens. You're right with him when he does it. Superb move there by Mark. How about that? He wasn't happy with the setup of that Riley Matthews car either. And I don't think Plum was looking in the rearview mirror. I think he was really concentrating more on what was going on alongside of him there. Goosens just drives the wheels off any race car he jumps in. He's looking for a podium. That was great racing. That all helped Joey Hand quite a bit because I thought he was going to be in trouble after dropping those wheels in the in the dirt back there. Just Covered gave him nicely. some breathing room, didn't it? Gave Scott Pruitt some more breathing room. It's something he knows about. Last lap, Pruitt about a second clear of the rest of the pack, so he has the advantage right now. It's his race to lose. There aren't too many drivers as exciting, as aggressive as Mark Goosen's at the end of a race when he has a sniff of a podium. Or those three there, Joey Hand, same way. Matt Plum, you know, he's the rookie, if you will, in the middle of that. When you look at Negri and Goosens. What a way to come back from the disappointment of the championship finale last year for Scott Pruitt and Mamo Rojas to come out of the box and possibly win the first two races. Still three minutes plus to go, but looking good right now. There are only three tracks on the Rolex Series calendar that Lexus oh. has not won at. Plum goes off. Tries a little too hard. Oh, no. Look at Ian this. James there. He's several laps down from the problems earlier in the event, but a very fast race car. That's Gurney. There's Joao Barbosa right behind him. DL, he's laps down in the black machine. Stacks these guys all up. That one little mistake by Matt Plum getting in there locked that. Did a great job, I should say, not going off that racetrack. Ian James just did Matt Plum a huge favor there. He's not fighting him for position, but Alex Gurney is. To get back to that point on Pruitt, there's only three tracks on the calendar that Lexus has not won at. This one, Barber and Montreal. Pruitt is just three minutes away from checking Homestead off that list. Barbos is trying to work something on Gurney. Can't quite do it at the moment. We talked earlier in the show about the Gainesville boys. Their qualifying performance has been subpar compared to last year. Top five here. Most teams would be happy. Not this group. They expect to be fastest. John Fogarty talked about a problem in pit lane. Lost them a couple of positions, but Gurney does not have the speed today to respond. Pruitt, Hand, Negri, Goosens, Plum, Gurney, Barbosa, and Frizzell. That's the top eight. They're all Daytona prototypes, all on the lead lap. Paul Edwards is the best GT. He's in ninth overall. Spencer Pumpelli is still second. And then Jan Magnussen has climbed to third in class after starting right at the back of this field. Leighton Reese, his teammate, did a great job. Magnussen has been outstanding as well. Well, he got it to the front once, then had yeah. the problem in pit lane. He's trying to do it again. Yeah, that's what I was about to say. After he got the penalty, he's gone to the front two times. That's the distance between Negri and Joey Hand. Going back to GT, here's the leader, Paul Edwards. Kelly Collins grabbed the pole. Can Edwards go all the way to the win? There's the sister car, and Pumpelli is the first Porsche you see. That's first, second, third in class. There's the DPs go. Got about second lead over the rest of the pack there, but that can be eaten up in a hurry. You just catch a slower car in the wrong part of the racetrack, and the race is on. Look at Magnussen using every inch of the racetrack, and Verna. First pro Daytona prototype you see there is Bill Lester, and he has worked that Southern Lexus back up into the top 10. Great effort from he and Shane Lewis, who will be the driving combination all year long. And I don't imagine this man is too pleased at getting passed by Jan Magnussen. <laughs> Werner, can he fight back? Time's not on his side. There's only a minute left. Hats off to the Pontiac guys. Their cars are good this year, and they certainly haven't been in the past. 
Battle for second here. Joey Han has a nice little gap. Negri now feeling the pressure of Goosens. And he knows. You know the characteristics of another driver door, so you know how aggressive they are. Yeah, you look in the rearview mirror, you got Goosens back there. You got a problem, no question about it. Especially this close to the end of the race. Whoa! Loose. Negri loose there. Remember, that's a right-hander, so those left-side tires didn't get changed. That's why he's struggling for grip coming off the right-hand turn. He just changed the right-side tires, remember, on that last pit stop he made today. Is there enough time left for Mark Goosens to do something about Oswaldo Negri? Negri got out of there really well, though, even, even that being said, Calvin. And he's okay up on the banking. I've noticed several laps that those right-side tires aren't giving up on the banking that bad. White flag is out for Scott Pruitt. One to go for the sports car racing master. Wow, I tell you, boys, the Ganassi team really done their homework this offseason with the new Pirelli tire. We spoke to the Pirelli group yesterday, and they said some of these teams are just so efficient, great technical resources, and you'd have to think the Ganassi boys are in that mix. And how about the 23 Ruby Tuesday Porsche? At the Rolex 24, it was... Well, there was some positive, some negative. They were really looking good at one stage. The motor ended up letting go. They finished 15. But this will really lift them in spirits. Joey Hand proving his worth here because I guarantee you that car is not stuck as well as some of these others. He's doing a great job staying where he's at. Yellow up here for some reason. Goosens is trying everything that he possibly can. A quarter of a lap to go. We've got a spin, and that's one of our Oh, here we go. Eggs. Goosens on the oh, inside, he see the, the grass. That is a Pappas Magnuson move from a few <laughs> years ago right there. Negri didn't get off the corner and immediately put the block on Mark. Yeah, he put him right into the dirt down there, and there's a big hole down. He saw the stuff come up. Pruitt continues the trend. Another new winner at Homestead Miami Speedway. Pruitt and Rojas make it two from two. The Rolex 24 at Daytona. And here, the Gainsco Grand Prix of Miami. And Chip Ganassi, what a group of winners he has. Scott Dixon, the pole position last night for the IndyCar race, and now he's a two-time winner already in 2008. In GT, it's a Pontiac affair. Paul Edwards, Kelly Collins start their new campaign in the right style. They didn't win at the Rolex 24, but in the regular sprint races, They've started it perfectly. Pole position and race win to the Pontiac GXPR. They were in the winner's circle, victory lane, a couple of years ago. They know what it feels like again. Not a mark on that car either. The boys did a good job today. Great job. Great team performance. I think it could have been a 1 2 for Magnuson and these boys. Pontiac has stepped up to the plate too with a big contingency program for the GT cars. But overall, and in Daytona prototypes, it's the birthday boy this week, Scott Pruitt, and his young Mexican teammate, Memo Rojas, who will stand atop the podium. Celebrations happening down here. Chip Ganassi congratulating Memo Rojas. Scott Pruitt, great finishing drive, and a lot of firsts here today. First victory for you guys here at this track. First victory for the new Riley Bodywork. First victory for Lexus. And it wasn't easy, though, was it? It, it wasn't. It was a uh, very tough competition. You know, we didn't know how to really play the strategy, so I think a lot of it, I mean, you can see that one group was on one strategy, one group was on a different strategy. And I got to say thanks to Lexus and TRD. They worked real hard with, with drivability, and this is absolutely the best the car's ever been. Thanks to Memo, Chip, uh, Carlos Slim, he's here, everybody at Telmex. It, it, was, it was an awesome day. The car ran absolutely flawless all day. Tremendous job and two wins and two starts this year. Well on their Hi way. to my family at home. <laughs> <laughs> well on their way maybe to that other championship. And Memo Rojas, if he wins the championship, what's he get then? He already gets a visit with the Mexican president for winning the 24 hours at Daytona. We hope he enjoys that. And Scott couldn't just let that one go, could he? <laughs> he had to remember to get that one in. A quick overview of the points. Great result there for the Ruby Tuesday boys. Mark Patterson and Oswaldo Negri will be pleased with third. They may have thought they could have gone for the win. And then the Riley Matthews combination there in a good top five position. And how about Gene Siegel and Matt Plum top fiving two in their new combination? Chris? Well, Scott Pruitt talks about strategy on the 01. Also, strategy with the Ruby Tuesday, boys. They leave Joey hand out when everybody else comes to pit lane, so he has older tires. But, Joey, you kept it up front with guys around you that had fresher cars. 
Yeah, that was like uh, running from the cops or something. <laughs> I mean, that was crazy. I, you know, these guys talked me through. Bill Alvin was on the radio, told me just to get her done. And, and all these uh, Ruby Tuesday guys, they saved the best for last. I'll tell you, we struggled with this car all week, and they hit it on the setup as best as we've had. Uh, you know, can't thank Ruby Tuesday enough. I had some Jumbo Lump crab cakes on there on a yellow and a little hit of Cytomax, and I was good to go, man. Bill told me, just run three laps at a time, three to five laps at a time, like you're qualifying. I was on the wood. There's no tires left on this thing. But I got Alex Jobe. I can't thank him enough for, for putting me in this car and giving me a chance. And, uh, you know, Bill Oberlin and I, we're going we're gonna to do some damage this year. Well, this team was so strong back at Daytona, but mechanical problems late in the going. They bounce back at Homestead. How about that? And the points look like this. 13 the difference between the Ganassi pair and the Gainesco boys of Gurney and Fogarty. And with that fine third place, Patterson and Negri move into third in the championship. We'll keep an eye on that. Remember, the next round is in three weeks' time. More from Homestead when we come back, because, of course, we've got to talk GT. We're back. We need to talk GT. Let's go to Chris Neville. Well, at the beginning of the race, Kelly Collins told us how important it was for Pontiac to come away with a strong finish, and the Banner Boys do just that today. Paul, how tough was this race? I mean, this GT field was so deep. Oh, yeah. I mean, after Daytona, too, this is just a huge win for the Banner Racing Pontiac's GXPR. And, uh, I mean, it's just the team has just turned these things around. I mean, we had a hard going on them, and they took some abuse at Daytona. And, you know, we had a positive test, and we just kept building on it. And this really, normally in the past history, hasn't been a strong track for our car, but, you know, the team pulled through, and shoot, I mean, after all those yellows, I could just charge again, and the th car gave me all the confidence in the world. Well, we anticipated a great battle with Pontiac, Porsche, and Mazda this year, and it looks like we're going to get just that. They, they bounce back very strong. 22nd and 7th at Daytona. They finished 1st and 3rd here. How about that? Great result in a very strong GT field for the 2008 Rolex Sports Car Series Championship. More from the uh, podium. Let's hear from Brian Till. Well, the Banner Boys may have won the race, but coming in second, Tim George, Spencer Pompelli, and along with your third at Daytona, you guys lead the Drivers' Championship. We talk about the depth in GT this year. Have you ever seen it stack so deep, Spencer? No, this is a really tough field, but uh, fortunately we got TRG, the guys back at the shop, doing an awesome job. So huge thank to, thanks to them. And also got to say hi to Jason Workman, who got uh, injured last week, I'm oh, sorry, last month. And uh, he's, uh, he's doing better every day. Jason, we're thinking about you. Can't wait to have you back at the track. Congratulations, guys. We congratulate the TRG boys. They've done very, very well, and they are the new points leaders. Spencer Pompelli and Tim George Jr. have just the narrowest margin over Ham and Tremblay, and then Kelly Collins and Paul Edwards, the race winners, just three back. Let us tell you about our SunTrust Improve Your Position Award winners from Homestead Miami Speedway in the DPs. It was the Riley Matthews combination of Jim Matthews and Mark Goosens. They made up 12 positions. And RJ Valentine and Brian Sellers made up nine positions in the 68 TRG Porsche. Final thoughts, boys, very quickly. Ganassi boys on a roll, two in a row. They're going to be tough, girls. The downside of that, Brumos and SunTrust Racing took a big hit here today. It was a very stop-start affair but still lots to talk about and lots to work on. We look forward to the next round in Mexico City. Autodromo Hermanos Rodriguez, a great track, a terrific event, and the Rolex Sports Car Series is alive. On behalf of the entire speed team, we'll see you in Mexico.